Hello, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please take your seats. Oh, and, At, oh, go ahead. So as a reminder, we'd like to uh, tell you or ask you to please use the hashtags on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we are having a conversation and we'd like for you to be a part of it. So it's hashtag um, Black Design Matters or hashtag Black in Design. So. And we're very excited about this second half of the event. Not only do we have um, sessions addressing the city scale, the regional scale, and a keynote with Phil Freelon and Daryl Crooks, uh, we also have performances from Genesis Fonseca and the Kumba Singers. And with that, we'd like to introduce Azura Cox and Shawnee Carter to introduce our next panelists. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we hope you enjoyed your lunch and were able to engage in meaningful conversations during the breakout sessions. My name is Azura and I'm in my third and final year in the landscape architecture program here. And I'm Shani Carter, second year in the urban planning program. And we're excited to present the theme and panelists for our city scale discussion this afternoon. Uh, so by now we all know that the world is increasingly urban and that cities embody large concentrations of resources and power. What, what we must question, however, are the resulting spatial, economic, and sociopolitical dynamics that become particularly evident at the city scale. Uh, in this panel, we will explore how design and planning interact with these dynamics and can shape a more equitable allocation of resources at the urban scale. So my great-great-grandfather traveled 700 miles from Mississippi to settle in Raleigh, North Carolina, looking for the opportunities and the freedoms promised in the urban, even in the South. Growing up in Raleigh, where my family has lived since, I became increasingly aware of the roles politics and design play in the fulfillment of that promise, but also bore witness to the impact everyday citizens can have from the bottom up. I went into planning because I wanted to explore the role intermediaries could play in harnessing energies at both ends to create more equitable cities. We're glad to welcome four such intermediaries to the stage today. Justin Garrett Moore joins us from Columbia GSAP and the New York City Department of City Planning, where he has led plans and studies of the design and utilization of infrastructure, public space, and land use projects. Liz Ogbu is the founder of Studio O, a multidisciplinary design firm focused on disruptive innovation in challenged urban environments. She has worked with a variety of communities to leverage the power of design to deliver social impact. Sarah Zodi is a 2015 graduate of the Landscape Architecture Program here at the GSD and also has a master's in urban planning from MIT. Currently a designer at Gustafson Guthrie Nichols, she also does independent design work for the cities of Rio de Janeiro and New Orleans. She was named a 2014 National Olmsted Scholar for her early contributions to the field of landscape and urbanism. Um, and then Sherry, Sherry, sorry, Franklin is the founder of Urban Design Center in Los Angeles, where she specializes in the development and financing of affordable housing, community, and infrastructure projects. Her focus is to use the design process to build long-term leadership capacity within communities. So each panelist um, will present his or her work for five minutes, and then we'll engage in further discussion and open it up to a Q&A. So to start off, we, we like, we'd like to remind everyone of our scalar provocation. Coming from such diverse practices, how do you engage both people and structures at the scale of the city? How does your practice interact with materiality, culture, and social consequences, especially as they relate to black communities? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, I've decided to uh, not necessarily show my own work as an architect and urban designer at city planning, but to show uh, really an, an important history uh, of the city and black design in the city, and I'm calling it what we ought to know. Uh, you know, I went to architecture school for a total of seven years, and very rarely did we talk about what black people did uh, in the design and, and building of the city. Uh, so, you know, to start, you know, channel Jane Jacobs, where she said that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. Um, so I'm going to share with you a, a history of the city. Uh, this is uh, Indianapolis, uh, circa 1940, and this is that space of great migration that was kind of introduced in, in our introduction here. And this was the space that black people had uh, for their city. Um, and so there are a number of responses to this that really 
determined a lot of what we consider the American urban condition. Um, so this is one response, right? The uh, sort of modern uh, model of uh, housing, public housing that was built. So this is what the federal government did, which was in neighborhoods like that, slum clearance, and to build housing like this that we all knew uh, had a lot of challenges, such as being designed for segregation. Uh, but what I wanted to offer was what is a different history that we're not often told and taught about in, in schools. And uh, this gentleman is my grandfather. Uh, he was uh, uh, the agricultural director for an organization called the Flanner House that worked in that same neighborhood. And what he did, you know, he was sort of the Will Allen of his time, and he ran a large urban agriculture program uh, in that community in Indianapolis. Uh, they had over 100 acres of land, everything from very small garden plots, uh, to large fields. This is in the city on 16th Street in Indianapolis around the 1940s. Um, so they had these programs. They taught canning, education, uh, nutrition classes that were really intergenerational to help the people that were in that community. Uh, they had even a demonstration kitchen in a community center that they had built, and they were teaching people how to cook food and really uh, a model for community engagement that was designed and was spatial, uh, but it was also social and economic. So these programs, what they call the self-help services programs, taught youth, uh, seniors, anyone that needed work, how to garden and how to make money to contribute to their families. Now, something that was really critical that this group of people, and keep in mind that these are black people in the 1930s and 1940s, were generating a new model for urban development. Uh, and community development. So this is a sociogram, a social study that they did about the families that lived in that community. They mapped and networked who were the leaders, who were the connections, where were their strong links and bonds for uh, finding ways to build capacity to change uh, that community and to improve the conditions. Um, so they got uh, together and they uh, did a program which was to build new homes uh, in the inner city, uh, 300 houses through a self-help program, and they uh, got approval from the city to build uh, houses with sweat equity so that people could build their neighborhood. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, and this was uh, designed by a black architect, Hilliard Robinson, uh, who was sort of a major and prominent black architect at the time. But the power of this image is that this Neighborhood was designed by black people. The, uh, it was built by black people, uh, and it was sort of a, a critical moment. So just for the context of you know, how this translates to city scale, uh, this is uh, Indianapolis. Uh, this was the area, the kind of inner city slum. This was uh, the federal uh, public housing that was built. Uh, this is what they did with that neighborhood. So they built 300 homes. The people owned the homes, uh, and they had Parks, schools, everything was provided in that community, uh, designed and built by black people. Um, but as we go into the future, you see that that model was actually able to persist. Uh, so this community uh, today still exists. They still have their school. They still have the homes because they owned the homes. But everything around you see, including the federal housing, did not work. It fell apart. It was torn apart. Um, so I wanted to end with a, a sort of sampling from a, a, the Flanner House's New Frontier Plan, which was a, sort of their ambition for the project. Uh, and it states, and I think this is sort of a manifesto, or it's at the level of manifesto for the city. They ask, what is it about? About people, about their needs, their abilities. It's about what people know and don't know and what they ought to know. Um, so. I don't have time to sort of show all of my own work, but basically we've taken uh, sort of inspiration from that work that was done in the past and uh, in, in doing projects uh, back in Indianapolis and similar neighborhoods. Uh, so you can find uh, information about that at urbanpatch.org. Thank okay. you. Hi, everyone. I'm glad that uh, we went through that this morning so that we all know now what is proper etiquette at this kind of conference. 
Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my work and, and less about going through all of the projects that I'm engaged in, but just more that in taking on the type of work that I've decided is, is my mission to do, of how it has completely reframed how I approach it as a designer and, and the shifts that I've had to make um, from what I was originally trained to do. So we do not have an hour to go into the academic discourse of wicked social problems, but um, you know, generational poverty, incarceration, gender violence, hunger, all of these are examples of, of wicked social problems. And I'm the child of social scientists, so we talked about these things as I was growing up, but I was also the weird child in my family who drew. And um, as I found my way to architecture as a path, that would be a great way to explore the drawing graphic ability. Um, I also tried to figure out how I could still connect to that mission and those discussions that I was raised with, of this idea of how do you go and make impact in the world. And so um, throughout my professional career uh, with public architecture, IDEO.org, and now with my own practice, I've been really fortunate to be able to do projects all over the world. And my central mission has always been how do I create impact, but use design as the tool in which to do it. And as part of that, it's meant that I've had to leave the purely physical environment uh, that we learn in school is the bane of our architectural existence and start to look at everything from how do you design hubs that actually can be economic catalysts to safe spaces for girls in northern Nigeria to a social enterprise that could deliver water um, health products to low-income Kenyans. And so for me, this has really come out of looking at a couple of different tools, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you more about today. Um, the first is this idea of systems thinking, and I think maybe that's what relates more closely to this idea of the, of the city and thinking at that scale, and just the, the need to think beyond the object. So, you know, when we talk about social impact as it connects to architecture, we can talk about, you know, an affordable housing development, we can even talk about reclaiming um, a vacant lot and turning it into a wonderful park. But, a lot of times we're actually also talking about how do we make an impact in a community. And that impact often needs to extend beyond just the pure object. The object is not divorced from it, it's actually part of it. It's part of an entire system where we're looking at issues of economic empowerment, health and well-being, social cohesion, and even something as simple as play and fun. And so for me, that is the design project. It's not the building. It's all of those things that actually create a vibrant and meaningful community. And so um, I think it was, um, um, Kwame, who said that um, he was not an architect, he was a builder of communities. And I would say, I am an architect, but I'm also a builder of communities. And in particular, the things that I'm trying to design is what I call opportunities for impact. And so it's sort of saying that the project is really how do you create these broader systems that make meaningful impact in people's lives. And so as part of that, I think it means that the inputs are different. It's not just about like the size that you have to work with or the budget. It's about things like the immigration debate or childhood nutrition or even gentrification. And that means that the outputs, whereas there's buildings as part of that or products, um, there's also things like advocacy campaigns, a social business strategy, a community benefit organization. All of these become part of the things that I design as part of the projects. But I also want to say that I am not doing the hero architect thing. Um, so it's not me by myself designing these things. It's who are we bringing to the table. It's public health experts. It's economic development experts. It's community members. We're all coming together to try and figure out how do we create the most holistic project possible. The second thing that I think has been really useful in framing my work is this idea of specificity, or as I like to say, people not categories. Um, so, you know, the past couple of years, we've kind of experienced a lot of visceral experiences that triggered the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray. Um, and it's not that black people started dying in the last two to three years. <laughs> It's not that we just started getting followed when we were in the wrong community or in the wrong store. Um, that is a long history and unfortunately will probably continue. But finally we started to have names and we started to have stories and we started to have faces. And it became less about the black men or black women being assaulted. It became more about Freddie Gray dying in the black of a police vehicle. And so for me, that's not just about thinking about the context that we're operating in, but it's also as a designer thinking about the context that we participate in. So one of the projects that I'm involved in is in San Francisco in a neighborhood called Bayview Hunters Point, 
which is for the last 75 years been historically African American. Uh, it's known as an industrial district, so pretty much every environmental injustice legacy you can imagine has been perpetrated here. Um, it's also one of the poorer districts in the city. It has the highest percentage of public housing. And so the site that I'm working on is the site of a former power plant. And when we talk about community, a lot of people default to the African American community that's living in public housing. This is a picture of an event that we just had in the community a couple of weeks ago. And for me, when we dumb things down just to a category, that similarly ends up being as bad as when we talk about black people getting picked by a police. It's the need for us to be specific about who we are talking about, because in actuality on the ground, the issues of the black person who's living in the public housing development is different than the issues of the black person who actually bought their home because they worked in the shipyard and earned enough money to be able to do it. They face very similar issues, but there is also incredible diversity in the things that they're undergoing. And so part of what we need to do when we talk about how do we do projects in this community is start to look at people as people and not representative of the category that we want to associate them with. It's the only way we're actually going to be able to understand what their critical needs are, as well as what are their aspirations in life. And so a lot of the work that I do is also about how do you create opportunities to be able to engage people in these environments and ask them questions. And that can be everything from you know, a workshop on toxic stress to doing a circus, um, which we've done a couple of years in a row. Um, and then the final thing, since I'm almost out of time, is this idea of empathy. Um, and I, I want to stress that empathy is very different than sympathy. I think a lot of times when we talk about practicing in some of these communities and we're like, oh my god, those poor people who are living in those very severely depressed environments. That is sympathy and that's not going to help anyone. Empathy is actually about emotional intelligence and using that to be able to then create something that can build capacity and improve their lives. And for me, it's really about this idea of both looking at people as individuals and hearing their stories and using that as a platform for development. So this is Oscar James, who's in that Bayview Hunters Point community. And you know, can talk to him about all the injustice that have per perpetrated in this community, but also he has stories of strength where they've been able to actually find a way to rise up above that thing. And it's not to say that you ignore the things that are bad. Actually, I, I want to stress that you listen and you listen even with more intention. It's not just, oh, this poor community, but it's actually like listening to their pain. And I think one of the critical things that I do with the projects is come in as an individual and actually say, I'm here to listen to you and listen to what you have to say. And that act of acknowledgement of the pain, but also their resilience, I think, is a huge part of creating better projects in these communities. Um, so here's the three tools, and thank you. Initially, the name of this conference seemed simple, Black in Design. As I reflected on it, I found the word in to be the most compelling of the three. You see, blackness and design are often positioned in opposition to one another. Design should do this for us, or design did this to them. Their mutual exclusivity prompted me to revisit the words of one notable Harvard alum, Du Bois, who states, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of the world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. He goes on to say that the end of the Negro striving is this, to be a coworker in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use his best powers and his latent genius. The breadth of the work in this conference speak to each one of these aims. So to declare that one is black in design, we position ourselves in this space, in the chasm created by the double self. We posit that there is here a latent genius untapped by contemporary design. I'd like to speak today towards a process for design to engage productively with spatial culture, especially those underrepresented in architecture's canon. I call this process interpretation. Lefebvre, Dissertot, and their contemporaries declared that people experience space in a multitude of ways. However, design has not progressed much towards articulating what those experiences are and how interpreting them might be generative towards design. 
Interpretation is really an analysis process that's at the heart of the basic concept of design. We are supposed to consider the experiences of others as we shape the spaces of their lives. But inherent in the way we are trained to see space are cultural assumptions that silently guide our practice of architecture. An elaborated process of interpretation aims to step us outside of these bounds. I propose three departure points as a process of interpretation. Lefebvre asserts that time is a critical fourth dimension to establishing place consciousness. So a redesigning of space with cultural re relevance requires an intimate insertion of time. The arts, including the performance arts, have historically been very accessible with low barriers to entry. They also form the roots of many oral traditions. As such, cultural production should be considered a registration of spatial vernacular. Different cultures delineate space in different ways. So this is about looking in the, at the distinct ways that people negotiate between private and public, indoor and outdoor, and types of uses. Of the three, this is the one we're most trained to identify. So this is set up to suggest that it is, these three are both nested, um, but also recursive. And we'll, I'll go through two projects through which this process, uh, this methodology has been both employed and evolved. This is Freedmanstown in Houston, Texas, constructed by freed slaves in 1866 on a swampy backwater that was then unwanted. They cleared the land, constructed their own homes, made their own bricks to pave their own streets, provided their own services and utilities, all things that the city refused them. Freedmanstown became the civic heart of black Houston, home to teachers, shop owners, lawyers, doctors. Over time, a series of traumas have continued to wipe away these structures and the people in them. A freeway bisecting the neighborhood, urban renewal, and of late, extreme development pressure given its proximity to downtown. Through a series of planning efforts, people stated definitively that they want something here to speak to their culture and history. At the time, I was working for a small landscape architecture office contracted to do the design of one of the streets. That's Genesee Street, which you see in re with relationship to the historic grid on the left. The original scheme was, oh, we'll just put trees 30 feet on center and put African symbols in the paving. <laughs> Um, I took the opportunity to make note of the very distinct delineations between public and private uses in the neighborhood and traced its architectural typology to West Africa, brought to Haiti by enslaved peoples who fled to Louisiana during the Haitian Revolution from where it spread to the bayous of Southeast Texas. You'll note that by orienting the shorter end of the home along the street, the settlers achieved a greater density of facades on each block, which had a profound effect on the social nature of the streets. The facades were in alignment with one another and had virtually no setback. The ubiquity of the porch created a gallery of spaces that punctured the streetscape, blurring the delineation between public and private. The public offering of the private facades were intimately tied to people's association with the place. So while some of these structures are still there, I studied them. I went out in different seasons and times of day to record the qualities of light, noting the patterns created by the stairs, porches, windows, and doors. I took note of the paving pattern the original settlers laid. You'll note that there's an orthogonal pattern on the roadways, which turns to make a diagonal in the intersections. I found through sort of urban legend that the settlers did this to highlight the intersection as a space of ritual and cultural performance. We recognized we had an opportunity to frame our street in a similar way, incorporating the historic bricks to elevate the intersections and abstract the dimensions of the historic structures with a series of black concrete walls, concrete panels, their color and material signifying the modesty of the structures. We didn't want to just summarize the past on a plaque. African American philosophies of time are largely influenced by a circular notion of time. The future is the future, but it is composed of pieces of the immediate pre present and the past. So we wanted to offer a new public space, but that aimed to invite the uses, interaction, and intimacy the neighborhood has borne witness to over time. To this end, I simulated both sunlight and artificial light, testing the shadow patterns these panels will cast on the street. I proposed using the actual wood panels from the structures to form the concrete, such that the concrete walls would become casts of the structures, an imprint of their grain. The planting would be central to providing shade in the Houston heat, but also to the spatial narrative. The leaves of the banana plants, fishtail palms, and weeping willows stretch through the cutout doors and windows. 
their thick, heavy swampiness speaking to the bayou edge the settlers originally cleared. As landscape architects, we were basically asked to put trees and benches on the street, and we did that. But interpretation would allow us to evolve that form and engage with the, na with the neighborhood's spatial culture in a productive way. We can find another illustration of this process on the other side of the world. This is Rio de Janeiro. In 2011, the city began upgrades to the sewer system downtown to prepare the, for the World Cup and the Olympics. And in doing so, they uncovered the, ru the ruins of the Caixa do Valungo, an infamous slave port where almost a quarter of all of the slaves brought to the Americas landed. In response to the outcries of activists, the mayor told newspapers the city would, quote, design a memorial that would represent the black experience. A few months later, I began my first semester here and received a Penny White grant from the GSD to go to Rio and ask the mayor's office, what the hell does it mean to design a black experience? <laughs> Their response was, we don't know, and do you, and could you design it? <laughs> so over the last four years, I've continued to work with the mayor's office in Rio and Worked on it here in my final year through the thesis track with Anita Bears Beatty advising. I knew what the mayor's office had in mind. The typology of the memorial is rooted in the notion of monumentality from ancient Roman and Greek empires. They're fashioned around the notion of an event, a war, a hero, a triumph, or tragedy, to trigger emotions outside of every day. Even the memorials that spoke to slavery tend to co-opt the language of monumentality, leaving unresolved the fact that slavery was not an event. It was 400 years of the way the world operated, its effects still present today. This became an opportunity to revisit a process of interpretation. Many black cultures of Brazil are also rooted in a circular notion of time. So looking back some 300 million years, we can see that the slave wharf which is that black dot, actually touched the southwest coast of Africa. And to this day, these lands span the same soil region and have floristic uh, similarities. Here you say that, see the slave trade routes in light gray and the shared soil region between the two continents. The Africans actively brought plants with them on the ships, which flourished in the Brazilian landscape and were used to reconstruct many plant-based rituals. So if we zoom in on that black dot, that brings us to Rio. This is the view that the Africans would have had arriving in the port. That's the site where the discovery was made. Um, the jetty actually jutted out over the water at the time. You get a sense of all of the infrastructure, the warehouses for storing Africans, and the corresponding open spaces all across the city that were needed for the sale and purchase of millions of humans. So, I linked that analysis to, at the bottom there to the contemporary city, which is in the middle layer, and found that a lot of these open spaces actually still exist within the city. And by referencing, referencing the mayor's redevelopment plan at the top, I came up with a series of parcels that this design project could potentially um, act upon. So with the three points of interpretation in mind, I looked to the diagram as a form of exploring the spatiality of time, the arts, and delineations near the old slave wharf. Let's take a look at one more closely. So here we are looking at the movement of bodies when urban spaces are taken over to play capoeira and Afro-Brazilian martial arts. While the assignment was to design a memorial, it became clear that the memory was actually embodied in these uses of space. So um, I designed. Sorry, I'm gonna go back. I designed basically. God, oh gosh. I want to go back. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thanks. So I designed not a discrete memorial, but rather what you're seeing here: a constellation of designs throughout the city. These resulted in a series of more concrete designs that the city would include in their redevelopment plan. So I'll take you through one very quickly. 
Um, this is the archaeological site. So through the historic analysis, we found that the um, actual extent of the old slave wharf was much larger than the archaeological site and proposed um, parcel swapping to expand our intervention. I identified the ficus genus as having been native to both continents. Afro-Brazilians believe that the base of this tree is where the ancestors gather, and they mark that through a wrapping of white fabric around the base of the tree. So I explored in plaster the forms that a wrapping of fabric could suggest. And I made this fabric wrap around the circular forms of these musical traditions with the circulation function of tying the favela just south of it to its urban and historic context, with a planting of ficus trees for shade to mark where the ancestors gather. So as opposed to the excavation box form an ar urban archaeology site normally takes, this wrap smudges the boundary of the site, blurring the delineation between archaeology and the city, between past, present, and future. The design was conceived of as territorial, appearing at times more boldly, at others more subtly, at times offering just a frame around the life taking place around it upholding in each case that the memory lives within the everyday uses of the people that occupy the spaces. We can't ask that the des every designer be of the people they are designing for, as Maurice said this morning, but we can compel design to develop methods that allow designers to step outside of themselves. This is important for design itself to evolve. My inquiries in these two projects led to questioning the constructs of the memorial, of native plants, of a streetscape, and beyond. The work displayed throughout the conference should not be considered self-referential, but should be approached with intellectual seriousness from across design. It's interesting that while black and design are oppositional, black and urban are used interchangeably. You know, urban schools. I don't doubt that this is related to the profound influence that black people have had on the space and culture of cities. Architecture has largely failed to recognize that influence in a productive way. To this end, interpretation aims towards a productive resolution of the double self, towards becoming what Du Bois calls co-workers in the kingdom of culture. We otherwise remain suspended in the chasm between black and design. Thank you. Well, I only have one slide, and I believe um, uh, Juanita Tate is in every community. For many communities, concepts of materiality are a luxury, perhaps unthinkable, particularly when disadvantaged communities have not had the opportunity to consider the manifestation of their environment. But it is opportunity that makes materiality a, a catalyst for the elements of change. These are elements that I have woven through every aspect of our work at Urban Design Center. That's advocacy, being present, driving accountability through every decision-making process, empowerment, engaging the voice of the people, the stakeholders, inspiration, purposeful, relational, both culturally and historically, equality, that's access and excellence, revitalization, the evidence of what we can do, exemplary work, pride, respect for the community, the people, the collective, prosperity, it's generational, we must pass it on, and legacy, accomplishment, validation, and the foundation of our work. We know that materiality is, um, of a built environment is inextricably strictly mandated by the distribution of resources, access to human capital, land use planning, building ordinances, and the implementation of policies set by city governments. The elements of these government mandates and how they manifest depends on whose opportunity is at the table. You are the opportunity, the brain trust, for our communities to truly drive change and ensure that what is brought to fruition today is a strategic, and continual catalyst for a beneficial future. The fact that you, the collective, uh, have come here today to deliberate the equality of our urban uh, communities 
is truly inspirational, and I have received so much in inspiration this weekend, more than any other opportunity I've ever had. But um, I did not have such foresight when I started out with my company. I was going to be a corporate titan. I was going to work in corporate America and be very happy. I was working at a boutique investment firm that sold large assets to Japanese trusts and pension funds. But a friend of mine from UCLA, Mandela Kaise, would continually call me and tell me, you need to go work in the community. And without fail, he made his case. I simply did not know what he was talking about. I was very happy being the opportunity for our clients. Then in 1990, I was looking out the window of our Santa Monica office towards South Los Angeles with my boss, and he says to me, one day, I'm going to build that place over, over there for people like me to live. And I stared at him intently as if to hope that he'd recognize that I must have some relationship to that community. And he just stared back at me. And then before I knew it, I said, you know what? Me too. I quit. <laughs> and as I started running down the hall to leave, he yells, he goes, you can't leave. We've taught you everything. And I turned around and I said, exactly. <laughs> so I jump in my car and I pull back my little sunroof and pull out my large brick of a phone back then. And I call Mandela and I say, OK, where is this place you want me to go? And I can hear his, his grin as he said, I knew you'd come around. <laughs> I said, just tell me where I need to go. He goes, Saturday, 12 o'clock PM, Vernon Central Library. That's where the community meets. It's Central Avenue is the birthplace of the African American community in Los Angeles. So I show up in my Brooks Brothers suit. <laughs> and I was there, and I see Juanita Tate, Robin Cannon, and Charlotte Bullock, with someone from the city of Los Angeles Redevelopment Agency literally pent against the wall, beat red. And as I walk in, Juanita points her long red fingernail at me, and she says, are you that little heifer they said they're going to send from UCLA? <laughs> I said to myself, are you talking to me? <laughs> and she says, um, yeah, I'm talking to you. Uh, will you tell this blankety blank to give us some blankety blank money for our blankety blank community? I'm like, whoa. And as I'm thinking about my good paying job that I just left, <laughs> I said, OK, sir, looks like to me you've got two choices. I can leave, <laughs> or you and I can go in this room over here, and you can tell me what's going on. He said, please don't leave me. I said, OK. So I, who are you, and what do they want? He says, well, Mayor Tom Bradley wants to build some affordable housing in South Los Angeles before he leaves office, and this is my first community meeting. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how much money do you have? He goes, $5 million. I'm thinking, well, that's no money. Hey, I was, after all, I was selling assets to trust funds. And so um, I said, well, OK, I'll tell you what. Does it look like I can help you? He said, yes. I said, why don't you give us $3 million, and you take that other $2 million to some other community someplace else? He says, deal. 10 minutes tops, get the first $3 million. So I walk out, and I say to Anita and Robin and Charlotte, I say, will $3 million do? Yeah, yeah, that'll work. Now, these women had formed a group called Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles, and they had successfully sued the city of Los Angeles to stop a conditional use permit to build a $500 million waste burn incinerator in the community. Now, that's environmental justice. But not yet fully understanding why I was there, I asked, where is this housing you want to build? They took me to 27th and Central. Now, when I was a little girl, I would run between my church, Second Baptist, uh, designed by Paul Williams, and my aunt's church. And around the corner, I would stop at this uh, at lot, and I would swing from a magnolia tree. So one day, I swung from this tree, and I fell down, and I cut my knee open. And I stood up just as plain as day, and I said, God, why doesn't somebody clean up this lot? So when we arrived at 27th and Central, 
and I saw a little piece of rope from that old swing, I knew that not only was I there to be the opportunity, it was my opportunity to help build this place over here for people like me to live. Hello? Okay, great. <laughs> um, thank you so much for these beautiful presentations. Um, I think we were struck by how personal these felt. I mean, words like interpretation, advocacy, empathy, narratives, historical personal narratives were sort of the common thread throughout. Um, so as just something to start off, um, we're wondering if you could talk more, this is an open question, um, how do you position yourself um, as an individual in your own personal history in relation to the very complex political and social networks that make a city. Um, because in the end, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, the, the personal and the political seem to be mediated in your work in a very striking way. Um, so we're just wondering if you could, if anyone wants to say a little bit more about that. Um, I can jump in the, um, you know, I work for, you know, city government and the work that I do day to day radically changes communities. Intense uh, work, and and the thing that you recognize is that this work is about people. Cities ultimately are people, you know, buildings, streets, parks, etc. But you know, the people are, are really what we're working with, and so ultimately, you need to be able to understand and relate with people, right? So that's the empathy, the narrative, and the work that we need to do. The skills that we have as designers really are finding ways to communicate with people, to connect with people, and to help people uh, kind of think about their, their environment differently. Um, I have a, a mentor uh, that, that passed a few years ago, Moshi Baratlu, and uh, she said that, uh, you know, the more uh, people know about their environment, uh, the more they're able to make it better. Uh, and so that's really our work, and it is a personal connection, right? It's your connection to your place, uh, your connection to other people, your connection to environment. And so, you know, cultivating that uh, as a skill and as something that you make yourself responsible to as much as delineation or technical skill or uh, kind of political process and operation is so important. Um, I try to de-emphasize the personalness of uh, the work that I do because sometimes I feel like the assumption is, well, you do this because you're black, don't you? <laughs> 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 um, and yes, you know, being born a black woman in the South does influence the way that I see things, but I don't, I, I believe in design enough to know that I, you know, if we were to value this kind of work that we could all be doing it or it could be trained or, you know, like, I think that designers can do important work. Um, so I try to down, personally, I try to downplay that aspect. I would maybe say I'm, I'm the opposite, that I didn't <laughs> used to bring in the personal that much. It was, you know, maybe for very similar reasons. And I think I thought, I, I don't want anyone to make assumptions about why I'm in this community and trying to make change. But then I realized like a year or two ago that there was, that distance actually felt a little bit hollow to me. Like I wasn't quite able to bring my full self to the work and I wasn't able to engage people fully. And so I started being deliberately personal in the work and bringing that to the table. And what I found was really interesting is that that allowed people on all sides to connect to me more and to trust me more. I think part of the challenge in a lot of places that I go into, saw the top line of that um, six circle diagram where like those challenges are huge. Um, and it's really easy to feel overwhelmed by them because they are so abstract. And when you're personal, it creates an ability to trust me to be able to say, all right, this is really scary territory that we are going into. We have no idea, the risk of failure is super high, but I trust you 
because you've taken the time to listen to me and you haven't just treated me like a project, you've treated me like a person. And I see this not only for the groups that I'm dealing with, but also for my clients. Like I work for not only nonprofits and social enterprises, but I also do work for, for corporations. And it's really easy to kind of paint them as the big bad wolf. And frankly, a lot of them have done stuff to earn that. <laughs> um, but then there are also people too and they, their motivations and the things that they're coming at are, are very personal things. And so when I take the time to engage them as people, I find I'm able to get them to go much further than they would have gone before because I've sort of found a humanity within them and I treat them like they have that humanity. And so, I don't know, for me, I've actually found that it's made my work better to be as personal as possible. And sometimes that's painful, but I think if you're not willing to risk pain, then you're not, it's, you can't get the big payoff that potentially could be on the other side of that, but that's just... No, I, to. just to respond to that, certainly we have the value or the benefit of being able to connect, especially with the communities that we work with. And so certainly I don't downplay that in those, in the building in those relationships, but it's funny because, you know, working with black Brazilians who mm. looked at me like, you're one of us. Yeah. I'm not Brazilian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> but, you know, I was able to play up actually my experiences in a way to build trust from a community that I have nothing to do with. Yeah, yeah. no, and I, I think, I mean, I do a lot of work in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's a very similar thing. Right. It's like, you know, we have something that we can connect around, and then that becomes the seeds for them to say, well, that white person you just brought in the room, I'm not sure I trust them, right. but you, I, I can do business with you. Right. I'm, I bring my personal self to every single project because uh, I believe that um, it is our voice, our leadership, our thought leadership that can help drive the process and maybe set the agenda and make sure that you're speaking from the voice of the people. I, I can't tell you when you know someone comes up to you and they pull you on the shoulder and go, you know, uh, we don't like that, or could you make sure that happens? I need to be able to speak up and be their voice and, and demand uh, that there's a level of accountability at the table, no matter what the project. Um, and I, I, I am now older, I like being older now, and I can speak my <laughs> mind and say what I want to say. <laughs> and, and so I, I don't apologize for what my core mission and my core values are uh, under any circumstances or by any means necessary, and that's how I approach every single project, and I tell people I will sell oranges on the corner before I give up my values. I just don't need money that bad. So, I, and that way we can keep accountability no matter who it is, mayor, you know, congressional people, uh, city um, officials, departments, and we demand our fair share of funding. And we've been able to do that and raise over $140 million for projects throughout South Los Angeles because we, we make sure that it is about community, about the desires, and about transformation first and foremost. So we're really glad that we've been talking about personal experiences and bringing your personal self to the project and to the engagement. But I wanted to specifically address the role of allies, and it's specifically allies that might not look like us or might be from outside of that community. Um, a, lot of a lot of people that are attending the conference today submitted questions beforehand about, you know, what can I do as a person that's not from a particular community to really engage with them and to build that level of trust and to still bring my personal self to the equation. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit more about, you know, Sarah, you, you address the need for designers to step outside themselves, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, and if anyone else has anything that they would like to say specifically addressing how we can create allies and better empower them. Sure. Um, yeah, it's not about apologizing for my values. I think that I encourage everyone to hold the same, these same values. Um, and so, you know, I was attracted to design coming from city planning um, where I felt like design had this sort of flexibility to it and an open-ended nature that really could allow us to shape, shape things, shape things, like, the, you know, design things. So we can form our own language, we can, spatial language, we can, we can have a vernacular, um, and I think that the burden is on design to develop those methods. I mean, I would just say that the majority of the communities I work in are not the communities I'm living in. And so, in a, a way, I'm always coming in as an, an outsider, and I think one of the most important things that I do before I go into any community is I check my assumptions at the door. 
Um, and I, I recognize that I have assumptions and I sort of list them out so I'm really clear on them and not let them come into the room. And then I think the most important first act that you can do is to listen. And not just like, yeah, 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 but actually deeply, intently listen as if you were talking to your grandmother. Um, and it, it, people can tell when you're listening to them and when you're not listening to them. And I think for them to begin, I use the word trust a lot, but I think for them to be able to trust you, which is what you need to do a good project, like showing that you're listening and responding and actually valuing what it is that they have to say and valuing their stories is actually like the biggest first act of design. Um, for uh, There's a project I'm working on in Los Angeles, Lamert Park Village, and it is a process where we're going about uh, defining cultural retail within a, and the core of the African American culture, Los Angeles, and uh, redefining the, how the, um, the buildings there, adaptive reuse. We're looking at building out uh, the two public lots. And so it's a very attractive community. People come from all over, and they want to help. But what we've done is we've set us, uh, uh, our objectives, and we make sure that everybody's very clear on what the goals of the community are, whether it's uh, ownership of some of the buildings that we're developing, making sure that they understand that it has to be cultural and Afrocentric, and about the diaspora. We appreciate other cultures, but this community is about the African community. And so we, we lay those out, and we welcome. Uh, right now, I'm working with a group of 30 um, uh, urban planners and architects have come to help from Cal Poly Pomona. I don't believe any of them are African American, but I've laid out a, a core curriculum for their class that gives them directive on how do they work with Sika, who sells um, incense and does ear, you know, ear piercing to help him build his business from his perspective. So we help people understand how to work in communities and that it is very important to do it from their perspective. So we'd like to thank the panel for their presentations thus far and open up for, yeah, we're, we're opening it up for about five minutes of Q&A. Hi. Um, I guess this panel is really special to me. While I was looking at you guys, I realized that for most of you, you represented kind of my own career trajectory. In a sense, there was a history up there. Justin, I've literally known we met our very first day of undergrad in architecture. <laughs> and we've been friends since we were 18. Um, Liz and I were classmates here at the GSD and graduated together. And Sara is one of my former students from the GSD. So there's a large spectrum <laughs> of history there. Um, Cherie spoke very, very beautifully about sort of this moment when her agenda became in inherently social. And I guess I wanted to ask for the rest of you, was there a similar moment for all of you when there was a kind of a shift in the way that you approached your approach design? Or do you feel it was something that was always latent in your design process? Um, I can start the, um, uh, so the picture I put up of my grandfather, the, some of you might notice that I really look like a lot like him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, he died when my father was five. I never knew him. And I was doing uh, some research and I found that photo. And it was, it hit me, right? Um, and then I started researching this organization and found out what they did. Um, and it, it was incredible what they did at that time. Uh, and frankly, I felt guilty uh, that I wasn't doing more. Um, and so the, the kind of the whole project Urban Patch, I didn't get to present it, but we've basically been doing, replicating in small ways that project, affordable housing, uh, community gardens, green spaces, uh, community projects, education. Uh, you know, I have two jobs already, and so it's like a third job, but I, I had to do it. Uh, and so it really did shift my mission because it was uh, a connection that you can't ignore, uh, the history of what we have done. Um, I think for me, it was it's something that took a couple years to evolve. Um, I'm the child of Nigerian immigrants, and my parents took a, us back when I was 16 for the first time. And uh, you've seen the Kohlhaas book, so you know the view of Lagos. Um, but you know, for me, it was really interesting because then when I went to take architecture classes, I was trying to reconcile the stuff that I saw when I went to Nigeria with what I was learning about Roman architecture and Greek architecture, and, and, and they were not meshing. 
And I was really fortunate enough to, to go to Wellesley, which actually does not have an architecture department. And so you could do courses at MIT, but you could also do what I call a choose your own adventure approach to the major. Um, and so I was able to take urban economics and urban sociology. And I sought them out because I was like, somebody's got to help me understand that thing that I saw and how the two can come together. Because it's the love of architecture and those spaces are both the core part of me. And I was basically trying to answer the question of myself. And so as I continued that journey along the way, the idea of looking at architecture as not only physical but inherently social just became a natural thing. Um, for me, it was always latent. Um, I didn't really know how I wanted to express the, like, I had, there was this drive to do something or to like want to be involved or like shape things, make things happen. But I didn't know what form that would take, like what agency I, I would have or, you know. So I tried a lot of things. I studied sociology and statistics and I studied city planning and it was very circuitous. And you know, until uh, maybe a few years ago, I didn't know really that landscape architecture existed. I don't, you know, and I, not to say like, I don't even understand really yet it. I don't really understand design yet and all the things that it can do, but um, I had this desire to be involved in things and it just became a matter of time, slow, slowly learning about what I could do. So it just, it, it was about like learning the tools and figuring out which one I wanted. Um, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you for the very thoughtful presentations. Um, I'm a curator, so I work a lot with interpretation and kind of breaking things down, translating them for an audience. And my question is about with architecture and landscape architecture and design, often there are these points of reference, there are these points of inspiration, and those things are not always necessarily visible or knowledgeable um, for the general public. And I'm wondering to what extent, even with the, the word interpretation, is it important for you all to be able to convey that meaning to the folks that are the users um, of these systems and these spaces, or is it imp just important for them to have a good experience in those systems and places? <laughs> well, so um, there was, a, I showed a slide of all of those notational diagrams, um, which was an exercise for me to see, to test the potential like fruitfulness of this idea of interpretation. Um, and I, when I was working in Brazil, I actually would bring that to the community meetings and the smiles on people's faces, you know, those drawings, you know, may not mean anything to you if you don't know the context, they're dots and they're lines. Um, but when, I, it didn't take much explaining to people. The, they saw themselves in those drawings and that was a really powerful moment for me in terms of communication and how to do it and why interpretation is important because it's not just about, it's not just, especially in black communities, like it's not just about the product at the end. It's about the process because the process has failed us so many times. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need to... <laughs> <laughs> So for us, it's like gaining, there's such a severe distrust, warranted distrust in planners and designers. And so for me, that aspect, growing that aspect of the design process is about like regaining that trust. I, I just add that I think that, you know, a good act of design should also be a little bit like a call and response, which I think that when you show that those diagrams to the community, it's this is what you've heard, this is what you've seen, this is what you've learned, and here is your response to it, which comes through the filter of your own design ability and creative ability, but you're taking those words and you're responding back, and so it's a conversation. And so I, I agree that community members are able to see that. They can tell that you listened, and then this is what you, you did with that, and then their interaction with it becomes their response to that. So thinking of the act of design or setting up experiences as like a call and response dialogue, to me, is one of the best ways in which to approach it. And you also learn by listening. Uh, we are working on the Sixth Street Bridge uh, Viaduct Replacement Project in Los Angeles as uh, the fund development consultant and also uh, handling the communication so that we can work with community to understand what this bridge meant to them or means to them. And we learn so much uh, beyond uh, the, the fact that the bridge is deteriorating and it needs to be uh, replaced, um, we were able to um, drive the decision-making process by understanding what that bridge meant to people 
on both sides, uh, in Boyle Heights and in downtown Los Angeles, and why it had to include um, those, um, those emotions in the design process and, and the city, we helped lead the design selection process uh, for the bridge and we were really excited that the architect, Michael Maltzen, uh did include a lot of those ideas in um, uh, the design and people began to see that bridge now in their new life and the new way they're gonna use it and in the new way uh, that they can connect uh, both sides of the city. If anyone has a burning question, last question, go ahead. Otherwise, burning questions? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you so much to the panelists and thank you all. Um, once again, thank you all. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce one of the loveliest people I know, Genesis Fonseca. Um, Genesis is an artist, a scholar, and, and an activist from South Central Los Angeles. Um, a poet at heart, she has received, uh, or recited her original work at community events and the College Union's Poetry Slam Invitational. Genesis earned a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and a Certificate in African American Studies from Princeton University. And she was currently pursuing a PhD in American Studies at Harvard University. So can you all join me in welcoming Genesis? Hi everyone, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful for the space. Um, I've been personally grappling with a lot of um, thoughts about environments, um, given that I stayed at this mental hospital at the end of my spring semester, um, and the space itself was very um, disorienting. And so since then, I've been doing my best um, to not only heal from the experience um, of being in an institution that was very um, confining, um, but also been reflecting on my own history. Um, I'm from South Central LA. Uh, both my parents are immigrants and my father's been imprisoned um, for many years. Um, so the concepts um, of design uh, are all things that I, I've felt um, very deeply in my body. And so um, today I wanted to share a, kind of prayer um, for all of us here as we go off into our professions, um, but specifically for those of us who are crafting our, our lives um, and as we think of designing so that we do things that uplift one another and that make us feel safer um, in, this, in this world. So thank you for listening. May the walls we build be built for peace. May the lines we draw, draw us closer to love. May the ground we walk on guide our mission. May our mission be to stand, to stand for justice, to stand for you, to stand for me. May we build spaces that withstand the racism, the oppression, the hatred, May those spaces be instead filled with grace to understand ourselves as bodies deserving of good food, of good streets, of good treatment, of good homes. May the walls we build not muffle our worries, not silence our pain. May we stop crafting prisons. May the blueprints we make be blessed and bring blessings. May we talk and mean what we say, may we listen, may we talk to one another. When we talk of change, talk of hope, talk of community, talk of love. When police sirens go off, may we keep our faith, may we keep on talking to one another, talking of love, of you, of me, of our parents, of our grandparents. May we not be confined. May we break all of the silence. May we then break the chains. May we remind one another to remember, to remember that we can't stop, 
that we won't stop, that God built us strong-willed with good reason, may we keep talking, keep hoping, keep marching. We design and keep in mind that the outlines of any city, of any hood, of any home are built by hands, for hands to hold, to hope, to keep holding on, to say we matter, our names matter, I matter. May we say our names and continue to rise and not be confined as we design. May we keep hope, keep holding on, keep talking, because we're talking about love, we're talking about revolution, we're talking about hope, we're talking about life inside each and every one of us, we're talking about love. And so now I want to end with a song, um, and I'd like us all to stand um, for this song. Um, and most of you may have already heard it, um, but um, the purpose is to kind of listen and empower um, one another. Um, and so I think this space is really beautiful. Um, feel free to join in um, and clap. Um, and just be aware of how beautiful today is outside when you go outside. Um, love one another and remember your history and that it's beautiful and it matters. Um, so if we could play this song, that would be awesome.
If you're just joining us, uh, th there are still open seats on the floor, so we invite you to come down. And thank you all for coming back. And we are going to open up for the regional scale. My name's Courtney Sharp. And I'm Catherine Curiel. Um, we're both um, urban planning students here and are excited to introduce to you our next speakers who are going to be talking about the regional scale. Um, and um, after that, we're going to just follow up with the same as we've been doing uh, before, leading a discussion with our speakers. So we have Brent Leggs joining us, who is a national thought leader in the field of historic preservation. He is also a former Loeb Fellow, and he is the senior field officer at the National Trust for Historic Preservation based in Washington, DC. Um, he, uh, is dedicated to preserving historic places that represent the diverse heritage of our nation. And he is the author of the book, Preserving African American Historic Places. We also have on the panel uh, Craig L. Wilkins, who is an architect, activist, and author. He serves on the faculty of both architecture and urban planning departments at the University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, he is recognized as a leading scholar on African Americans in the study and practice of architecture, and he's also the former director of the Detroit Community Design Center. Uh, his hip-hop architecture theorist works explored various cultural, uh, social, and political historical, uh, historical aesthetics. And we also have uh, Unika rogers Sip, who is rejoining us to talk about her work with ecotourism. So thank you for joining us, and with that, we'd like to invite Brent, Brent Legs to the podium. Oh, sorry. Uh, like we were doing for every other scale, um, I'm just going to tell a quick story. I got a little carried away. Sorry. Um, so just 
to set the stage, um, I would like to explain how the regional scale has affected me personally. My family migrated from Mexico before I was born. Because of my family roots, I've had the opportunity to live in two different countries. I spent seven years of my childhood growing up and going to school in a different country, um, not in the US. My family still celebrates Mexican holidays, and my identity is closely tied to the history and culture of Mexico. While many people feel that their uh, community is close to them in proximity, I constantly think about how I can contribute to the well-being of the people that I met in my past and those that live uh, far away from me. I hope that, that this discussion can help us think about how our actions as designers and planners affect the people that do not necessarily live next door to us. Thank you. Before I begin my presentation, I just want to say how wonderful it is to be part of a community that gets the value of preservation. So thank you all for the amazing work that you're doing to preserve African American historic places and the culture and history that those places keep. When I was a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, I had the good fortune to conduct a statewide inventory of historic Rosenwald schools in my home state. Rosenwald schools were constructed between 1917 and 1932. It was a massive school building program that was visioned by Booker T. Washington and funded by Julius Rosenwald, who at that time was the second president of Sears and Roebuck. Together, they helped to construct over 5,000 schools in 15 southern states. During this process, I learned that my mother and father attended Rosenwald schools. And, and, and you can imagine the connection to these places once it became personal. I began to have this multi-sensory experience with these places. I could see, I could touch, I could smell, I could hear the creaking floorboards as I walk these often abandoned and forgotten buildings. But there was also this sixth sense, this transcendent quality, transcendent quality about the value of historic preservation. It eliminated the gap between space and time. It was about the continuity of history and culture. And I knew then that Rosenwald and Washington's vision for uplifting the black community directly impacted my life. That vision was real and ongoing through the value of preservation. African Americans have cared about preservation for you know, hundreds of years. And on an informal basis, that's Rosenwald schools. <laughs> on an informal basis, we have been committed to preserving our history. So I'm sure you all have contributed to the Ch Historic Churches Building Fund at some point. To, <laughs> we've all done that. <laughs> to conserve an important community asset. Every time volunteers <coughs> mow the grass at a historic cemetery, they are conserving an important cultural landscape. But to do preservation in a formal way takes a real commitment from the African American community. And I just want to give you a little background on the first organized effort within our community. And this first took place at Frederick Douglass' home, Cedar Hill, that's in Virginia. In 1916, the National Association of Colored Women organized to raise $20,000 to protect this estate. And I want to read their mission statement, which in many ways to me kind of feels like a, a prayer. To restore Cedar Hill to its former beauty, that we may make of this historic place a hallowed spot, where our boys and girls may gather during the years to come and receive hope and inspiration and encouragement to go forth like Douglas to fight to win. That's what motivates me to do this work. It's about reconstructing a new identity within black America. So fast forward 100 years later. In 
And I had the opportunity, of course, to work at the National Trust. Uh, I built a regional program. It was called the Northeast African American Historic Places Outreach Program across 10 states. And the goal was to empower, encourage, and support stewards that were saving African American sites. The National Trust uh, 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 created a new business model. And our signature program is called National Treasures. I currently manage four National Treasure projects. The A.G. Gaston Motel that is in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. It's where Dr. King had his war room at the epicenter of the civil rights movement in that city. Uh, also, Joe Fraser's gym in Philadelphia. And I want to quickly highlight two National Treasure projects. The first is Hinchliffe Stadium, a Negro League ballpark in Patterson, New Jersey. It is the only National Historic Landmark in baseball. It hosted three professional Negro League teams, New York Eagles, New York Black Yankees, and New York Cubans. So how do you preserve a building of this scale, 7,500-seat 7, open-air stadium that's all concrete, that sits within the heart of a former industrial city that has faced years of disinvestment? You know, we've done the standard preservation plan, engineering analysis. Now we're focused on the business planning. I want to leave you with some questions. When a site is constrained in its size and potential for revenue generation, what are the realistic potential uses and user groups that would support a project of this scale? What's the financing strategy for a $32 million redevelopment project? Here's another view. What are the uh, parking options for this scale of events when there's no infrastructure to support it? This is my favorite project. Madam C.J. Walker's estate that's in Irvington, New York, uh, one of the most significant historic sites, historic residents, I, I think, in America. It is exceptional in its beauty. We can leave it there. Look how beautiful that is. Designed by Vertner Tandy, the first licensed black architect in the state of New York. So similar to Hinchliffe Stadium, asking the questions about how do you reuse a property that will be protected with an easement, the strongest legal protection uh, of a, pro a property of this significance. So again, what are the appropriate uses? How does an impact or, or an easement restrict and, and impact those future uses? For a property of this significance, size and quality of finishes, what are the appropriate revenue generating uses that aligns with the site's legacy, that increases public benefit, and that ensures the financial sustainability of this historic site? Also, given its residential neighborhood context and limited on-site parking, who's the audience? And how does a future owner control access to the property? And just lastly, as I am out of time, I uh, want to highlight um, what I'm calling culture concepts. So 2016 is the 50th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act. Preservation is so starting to be reflective about the impact of that historic legislation as well as the future of the movement. And these are five concepts that I think uh, has potential. And I will just share one, and that's language. We've heard today the language of, of culture. I want to move the preservation movement away from preserving old buildings to saying that we are preserving culture. I think that that resonates with more diverse communities. I think it helps preservation to be more inclusive and allows us to build collaboration and partnerships. Thank you. As Craig makes his way to the stage, I want to follow up on something that Brent said. And if you're interested in learning more about the Rosenwald schools, there was a very good documentary that came out this summer. And you can find out more about it at rosenwaldfilms.org. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, um, uh, don't start my time yet. I just I have to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheating, but I, it's only three of us, so we're good. Um, 
but, but this, is, this is actually uh, important. Um, for folks who know me, they will know that I'm, I'm an angry man. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm angry most of the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, James Baldwin says that, you know, to be black and conscious in America means that you're just in a rage. Um, and so uh, that, uh, that resonates with me. But I wanted to, to say that I was speaking to my panelists earlier that um, several times today I've been brought to tears uh, by just the focus, the passion, the, um, the belief that, you know, people of color are important and design can make a difference. And um, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, to, to say that, um, and I, I won't dwell on it, and I, hopefully you will cut this from the video. So you should give yourself that. That hand is for you. Um, okay. So now we'll get started. And now I'm angry again. <laughs> so um, I, I, I wanted to, to to take this brief time to talk about assets, because it's my belief that uh, if you want to address the conditions of the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the poor, the underclass, the other, um, that this is an area that needs particular attention and one in which designers can be extremely useful in the creation, recovery, and development of assets. So for a variety of reasons, from redlining to spatial profiling and gentrification, the typical material conditions of the majority of people of color at first glance seem to be without any assets of value, or at least assets that directly benefit the residents, neighborhoods, and uh, communities. They have their unfair share of incinerators and chemical plants and maintenance hubs. However, assets directly beneficial to, uh, or something that someone in a moment of giddiness might call an amenity, are few and far between. If they have schools, most of them are underfunded or underperforming, if not closed. If they have parks, most are desolate, undermaintained, if not closed. Access to healthy food is difficult, access to healthy jobs even more so. The privatization of public realm often criminalizes accessing the few resources available and spatial profiling both in and out of communities of color keeps citizens constantly on the defensive. We, we know this. The Baltimores and the Fergusons of the nation are easy to see, but the Detroit Belle Isles and the campus marshes, not so much. It's not just cities, but it's regions as well. The Urban Institute recently released a report that concluded the bigger the region, the more the inequity. Today, neighborhoods are more separated by income, assets, and educational attainment than they were in 1960. It seems that we, as a society, have become comfortable with what urban geographer Rashad Shabazz calls architectures of confinement physical and psychological acceptance of asset-free boundaries of lowered expectations, perhaps too comfortable. So given this context, I was asked to speak about how my work might be considered regional. I was stumped. Um, so I'm going to try to fit this into this, this section. Um, I work with communities of color uh, primarily for whom assets of their own are rare. These communities can be found just about everywhere, so I guess that's regional. Uh, the conditions I try to address, spatial access, resource allocation, and life opportunities, tie into a larger vision, not just of a neighborhood or of community, but of cities and networks. So that might be another way in which this becomes fairly regional. But I also spend a lot of time writing, um, which I see as a critical form of social engagement where ideas about design and justice come into contact with a broader public. This is certainly 
uh, a third regional component. So when we worked on transforming public housing in North Minneapolis into a mixed income, holistic, connected, reconnected universe, uh, uh, neighborhood to the larger city, or uh, help residents in Detroit envision new uses for closed public schools in their neighborhood, the tenants that form that foundation uh, are found in my writing in uh, the Activist Architecture uh, book, uh, which is pushing forth uh, community-based participatory design, and they were central to our efforts. Both the process and the product have regional implications. When we decided to go grab materials headed for landfills like doors and studs, and along with community artists, fabricated transit seating uh, that was uh, designed to relieve the pressures of the regional transportation system, uh, that also was a regional connection. A kind, and um, so currently, uh, where are we? Oh, there we are, okay. Uh, it, was <clears throat> it was also a kind of hip hop approach to design and practice that was suggested both in the Aesthetics of Equity and um, another book, uh, uh, Roughneck, uh, constructivist. Um, and so my most recent project, Diversity Among Architects, is in many ways a catalyst for the next uh, asset recovery work, um, currently focused on the conflation of housing, public health, and educational services. And I believe that also can certainly be applied regionally. And in fact, it is our hope that it will be. The objective that un unites all this work is the desire to make design more accessible and responsive to the general public, particularly those on the margins of society, um, by any means necessary. In my experience, the problems of the poor are not because they are poor, but because they are treated poorly. So poorly, they can only be poor. And that, I imagine, is not simply a regional concern, it's a global one. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Craig. So what you guys don't know is that I'm, uh, my low fellows know this, I'm pretty emotional too. So. Um, I'm not emotional. <laughs> <laughs> You're angry, <laughs> which is emotional. <laughs> so I'm gonna try not to, uh, I'm gonna hold mine back uh, for, the, for the duration of, have you started yet? <coughs> good, good. Okay, so uh, preservation and assets. This is a, a great uh, combination <coughs> for my talk. Um, I did speak earlier today about working in the Black Belt region, uh, a region which has been, in my opinion, treated very poorly. Um, I worked with uh, farmers, I worked with families who've inherited uh, their land, and simply, quite simply, they're just trying to do what they can to hold on to their land. Um, this is a challenge, oftentimes, because of the, the horrific, sometimes, conditions that uh, people are faced with, nevertheless, um, we move forward. So I guess personal identity as it relates to this, this particular aspect of my work. Um, really, I, you know, when I left uh, rural North Carolina and I went abroad to study, every time I would come back uh, for the holidays, I would talk with my friends and we would look, you know, around in the community and things weren't just the same as they were. It's like, you know, well, what's, happened to that um, playground over there? It used to be so nice. And, or, you know, what happened to the community center? Uh, uh, Mrs. Jones is not there anymore. Who's keeping it up? Nobody. Um, and so I guess I sat on the bench for a long time, really complaining about what the community wasn't doing and what the community needed. And my grandmother, being the wise woman that she was, she said to me, um, well, everything that we taught you about doing right you're doing somewhere else. And I was like, hmm. So you're saying that um, the community, <laughs> if it's gonna you know, be better, it's gonna be up to me to do that. So I think that I you know, came to that uh, agreement with her, I came to agreement, and I came to a commitment that there would one day be something that I would do in my work that would um, sort of reclaim and, 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 
and really helped me step into the position, along with other people like myself who migrated out away from the small rural places that they came from uh, for opportunity or what have you. Um, and that's really what I want to share with you today, how we're doing that. So this might be an example, or actually is an example, of what uh, the families that I work with, what might happen, what you might see on their land. Um, as a result of uh, absentee ownership, um, there might be one elder in the, in the family that uh, is, is there um, occupying the space. But the rest of the family is off doing what they do. And so um, this was such an alarming, I mean, there are hundreds of these types of homes uh, that are, that are uh, displaced, uh, spaced out in the communities that I work in. And it was so alarming uh, uh, within two years of starting my organization, uh, Sustainable Rural Regenerative Enterprises for Families, that we decided to create a volunteer program um, and we were actually asking people to help, <laughs> you know, uh, people in my network, people at the GSD, uh, please come, come into the community and uh, help us with, give us ideas. What do we need to do uh, in partnership with the, the owners here, the families here? What do we need to do in order to revitalize? So um, somebody heard us. Ford Foundation uh, invested in us. They wanted to... Um, help us with this project, and, and it was another way uh, in which we could also create some revenue, we thought, um, by creating a, a community-based tourism um, value chain. And I wanted to share th the value chain that we constructed with, with uh, the help of the Ford Foundation, because it's an important part of how we are actually in a place like uh, G's Bend, Alabama, for example, or other uh, small towns like G's Bend, um, where there has been this sort of contested history, um, there has been uh, a lot of racial discrimination, um, no trust, and how, develop, how can development happen when you are not in a, a trustful relationship with uh, people who you have to get things done with? So the guiding principles that we utilize um, is a wealth creation uh, process. We measure wealth. Uh, uh, is, is being uh, measured by the, what's being created or retained. Um, everyone is in it all together for the long haul. Uh, intentionally balances mu mutual benefit um, of everybody in the chain. All known costs are considered and addressed. And we obviously work to influence policy along the way. Well, this is an example of the way in which uh, we are looking at the types of wealth. So the built environment is obviously there, uh, as you see. But we also are looking at the individual wealth. I spoke a little bit about that earlier, how we invest in people, uh, the social benefit. How are our relationships with one another? What are the new uh, partnerships, the new relationships that we're creating? Um, and the intellectual piece again. Um, the political, I talked a bit about that. What are, what are we doing to influence policy? And also the financial. I'm going to skip through that. This is an example of how this program is sh shaken out in the community. Um, we started typically with any planning situation and we started mapping assets. Before this community was, uh, we started working with G's Bend, for example. None of these places that you see here were on the map. And as you can see as, uh, from the index, there are Roosevelt homes, there are historic homes, there are lots of cemeteries. Uh, that are there, and these are the communities, um, their idea of what's important to them. So when the idea is that if you come to visit this place, you're gonna visit uh, G's Bend from the perspective of what they want to share with you. And also, not just what they wanna share, but what they are sharing with you in a development process is they're taking on these assets and developing them themselves. So this old nutrition building that you see there at the top right, that was uh, an old school. It's being converted now uh, into uh, a community design center. Um, we work with the young people in nearby colleges to help uh, articulate the vision. And this is an example of how our outcomes are. Um, 
going in on a project like this, six months of constructing a value chain, we as the intermediary, bringing all the stakeholders together. Um, we might not have any service providers in the community. We create the curriculum and we train people of how to be service providers and to welcome people. We might not have any uh, new relationships to help, new businesses uh, to help uh, uh, with the delivery of the services. For example, uh, homestays. Uh, those homes are actually turned into places where people can stay. Um, so businesses have to be created for those homes to exist. Uh, and I'll just go into a little bit more here, one more. Uh, so the financial piece, we created a fund uh, that is uh, a sort of a cyclical fund. Um, any profits that come from the trips go into this fund and they help start up the other local businesses. There's some of the ways in which we're measuring and we're actually baking in uh, sort of equitable and fair processes to build wealth. Again, that's my favorite picture, <laughs> my image I wanted to show you again. So I mean, I think the only way that I could really show you how we are mapping, uh, <coughs> this, this work is kind of shaking out, is that we have relationships now. Uh, we started this project in Alabama, uh, and our intention was to uh, grow it um, out of Alabama into Georgia, into Virginia, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, and we're doing that. And these are many of our network um, uh, members. We have a, uh, all of them are engaged in some level of revitalization and preservation of historic buildings, uh, schools. They are involved in um, all kinds of interpretive uh, businesses. It's just amazing. And so what are ideas that we hope that in a year or so, you guys will be able to come and uh, visit these places, an agricultural heritage preservation, tourism, ecotourism route, um, being able to give back into these places with your talents, um, stay in these beautiful environments, and contribute towards the development that is really uh, all of our responsibility. So thank you. Thank you all so much for your wonderful presentations. So in advance of arriving here, as you all know, you were presented with a survey and there were questions that you were allowed to submit. And so we'll be asking two of them to our panel before we turn it over to you here. Um, I'll start with the first question. And a theme that I saw throughout you all of your presentations was this idea that design can actually, and what I've actually heard throughout the conference and also the, the questions that we got, but was that design can actually um, have implications of like, so, like social concerns, like Preg um, kind of leveling the field of um, wealth and um, kind of addressing the issues of inequality and in, um, in the wealth creation. And so the question that I have is, how can mostly a uh, field that is mostly aesthetic and um, like all <coughs> architecture have implications that affect um, kind of the social concerns like wealth inequality and um, make, pro make our society progress? Hello. Um, preservation in many ways, I didn't get to talk about the concept of activism, but preservation creates public participation. It then leads to increased investment <coughs> in um, African American communities. It has uh, residents, part of the political process, where you're trying to seek bond funding to support a preservation project. You know, it, it has a lot of, um, economic value and political value, but the other concept is spirituality. I think that we can begin to draw from the lessons in black history and to use the embodied culture to create an empowerment curriculum. And that's around this concept of connectivity at the regional level, that if, if, if historic sites begin to collaborate, 
that, um, again, we can create a, a, a structure that begins to reconstruct that new identity, uh, internal identity, identity within black youth. And for me, that's um, social value um, and, and the health benefits that we need in our community. Um, I, 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 take a, I would take a little uh, issue with uh, the profession uh, being um, perhaps uh, or, uh, an, an aesthetic one, or an aesthetic one only. Um, uh, simply, simply because, I mean, we've seen here today, um, many of the presentations aren't really about a pro uh, an object. They're about either a process or people or, uh, or place or space. And I, I think if we only focus on um, a, an object, then we first self-marginalize ourselves uh, because we can do so much more. We've seen that we do so much more. Um, but we also, we also increase the marginalization of, of the value of what designers bring um, within the general public, because if they think all you do are, is to focus on an object, then when they don't need an object, they don't need you. And I, 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 I categorically dismiss that um, as the value that we bring. It's one of the values that we bring, but it is not the only one. Um, and sometimes it's not even the primary one. Sometimes the best design is no design at all. Um, so what we have um, is the ability to really sort of look at issues, concerns, questions, um, culture, and bring to bear a kind of way of seeing the world, a kind of design thinking, for lack of a better term, um, that can be applied to not only objects, but systems, to structures, to the, to the whole gambit of sort of what makes, um, uh, makes a, a, a society run. And um, I, 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 I think if we simply, and I don't think people here think this, but, um, but if we simply think about what we provide is the, the image of the object. In about 10 years, the, 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 the licensing of architects will be gone because you bring nothing else to the table. And you know, wh why should you have a license? Because you know, I, I wake up, I, I have a sense of design. Not just me, but somebody in the street. I have a sense of design. What makes yours better than mine? It doesn't. So we have to have something else you hang your hat on. Um, so I, I would just differ with the, the fact that, you know, what can a profession bring to this if it's focused on the aesthetic? I don't, I don't want us to be that way. I want us to be something else. I don't want us to be more than that. So. Yeah, I think, I think what I've tried to do, um, well, just what I've done naturally with um, my career over the years in fashion um, was looking at object objectification um, and something that might be considered frivolous and um, changing it really to be something that's uh, powerful, empowering, uh, you know, educational. And uh, it's, you know, I agree with what Craig was saying that it, the aesthetic piece of it, I mean, we are motivated by beauty, you know. There was something beautiful that happened here today that brought you to tears, right? Um, beauty, <laughs> you know, and uh, we, you know, we are taught uh, to use and see beauty in the world, thank God. Um, but um, it's definitely more, more to it. And um, I, the, one of the most powerful phrases I've ever heard was that um, in terms of the built environment or built, you know, infrastructure, built buildings, was that um, around education, you know, um, buildings don't teach kids, <coughs> people do, right? And so um, oftentimes um, people think that the solution, we see a lot of times that the solution is something, we're gonna create this beautiful 
gorgeous building and you know the social ills or the whatever goes away and uh, it's we got lots of empty buildings all over the place that aren't being activated that there's there's something deeper uh, and that's needed so that's my two cents and I don't I don't want anybody yeah. to get me wrong I'm not saying that you know we don't do gorgeous things it's I don't I'm just saying that they aren't it isn't an either or proposition it okay. is a both and proposition. Thank you. So in your experience, have you found the contributions of African and African art um, and architecture to be given equal credit to the works created by white designers? And if not, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if not, what can be done to promote the importance of architectural and aesthetic um, creations by black designers? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is beyond my scope. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not actually. It's not. It's not. And here's why it's not. We were talking. We were talking. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, we were talking earlier about you know what you do about you know uh, about historic preservation, mm -hmm. and so often we talk about historic preservation as pres preserving a building, an object, right? Um, and, you know, I'm right with you that, you know, it's sometimes, it's, it's oftentimes, it's not just an object, but it's a place, it's a culture, something that happens. Um, so, for example, there's a, there's a gentleman, uh, Samuel Plateau, I don't know if you guys know this guy, he's an architect, uh, well, was an architect many, many years ago. Did a lot of stuff in South Carolina, also in Georgia. Also, he did building. I mean, he did what, you know, you did as an African American in that time. You, you, you sort of did everything. If we look at that work simply as an aesthetic object, you might say it's fairly utilitarian. You might. Um, but if we look at it as, as a, um, as, as an intervention in a culture, as a way to sort of create a space where people of color can actually access the other side of the river and they can access opportunities over there and they can access, uh, they can just, build, like we just saw uh, today, the, the homes uh, that were built in, um, well, you know, Hilliard Robinson is, guy, but uh, the things that were built in, in Indianapolis, we might look at those and go, ah, you know, that's, it's, you know, that's, we see that a lot. Yeah, but you don't see a lot of that from black people. That's what makes it, you know, the, the thing. So I, 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 again, I think, I think we need to look at an entire context and not just, you know, and I'm, so when we're talking about you know, whether uh, people of color get credit for the kinds of stuff that they do. Um, I think often we don't because it is only judged by that lens. And when you open up that lens, you go, oh my God, man, people of color have made so many uh, contributions to how we live and how we work and how we engage each other. Um, I, I think so, you know, why this happens? I think because we're judged by a very narrow lens. And I don't necessarily just mean we as people of color in the field, but just the field itself judges it by a very narrow, it judges itself by a very narrow lens. Um, and uh, uh, that's unfortunate. Like we look at the, the work in New Orleans, right? And we see all that beautiful iron work. But really, folks don't really talk about the ironwork. They talk about New Orleans and the buildings and stuff. But it, the only reason we love it is because of, well, not the only, but one of the main reasons we love it is because of all that intricate ironwork. You know? And it's only recently where folks have been attributing that to you know, people of color and you know, folks who were working um, both as freed and uh, enslaved folks. And now you see that on the mall. You see that work on the mall. So it's hard to argue against that now. But we have so many traditions in this, in this field that are never going to make it to the mall. So do we discount that? No, of course not. We have to open up the lands. So that's my, I'm done. <laughs> well, I would uh, just add to that. Um, 
Art has a real role in the field of historic preservation. I don't know if any of you have been to the African burial ground in New York City. When there's no longer any physical evidence on the landscape, art can be a powerful tool to help reinterpret that story. Also thinking about Project Row Houses in Houston, Texas. You know, a, a, a painting inspired an entire revitalization strategy within a historic African-American community. So art has a really important role in preservation. So, but your question about uh, whether or not African-American work is in academia, uh, getting credit as designers? Is That's that part of it. Part of part. it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I'm writing a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't give too much away about that, but I would say um, no, <laughs> no. Um, and part of it is is you know we talk a lot about uh, control as a way of measuring wealth creation. That um, you know um, ownership uh, is an important part of that, and so as it you know relates to the, any sort of cultural production, who owns the cultural production. Oftentimes, uh, the work uh, that I do, I find myself maybe, you know, cr helping create a sustainable business plan, right, with community, or a revitalization strategy. Um, but oftentimes, I'm also sometimes fighting, helping fight legal battles, because someone some, has come in, uh, an outsider, and try to take the culture production uh, and own it, extract it. Um, and uh, this, is, this is, you know, and so extract it is one piece, but then also uh, when they, or sometimes these relationships are happening, these kinds of relationships are happening, there's a control over the cultural production. So certain things are being suppressed, right? Certain standards are put in place and it then becomes something else. So, um, and then that then gets owned by someone else, right? So, it, I say all that to say that this is uh, uh, an ongoing issue in the sense of ownership of, of, of design and ownership of cultural production. And, uh, you know, my experience is, it has been very specific to that uh, as a designer, that uh, there were things I may have done and uh, did very well, had to, in order to get you know, a job, for example. Uh, and my scholarship was just not accepted. It wasn't good enough, you know, um, because it wasn't coming from a particular group or institution. So anyway, that, that's in the book, <laughs> which will be coming out so, um, but yeah. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to turn it over to the audience for about 10 minutes of questions. One in the front, Mr. Cox. <clears throat> Today's my day, I guess, for platitudes a little bit. Uh, most of you will have to ask your parents about this, but Ebony Magazine used to present a kind of lifestyle, an aspirational lifestyle for uh, people of color. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's sort of the backdrop for this comment. Uh, <clears throat> but this is, this is a story that a father is reading to his daughter a bedtime story. And it's about the jungle and the lions and the hunter. And at the uh, point in the story, at a point in the story, the <coughs> lion gets slayed by the hunter. <coughs> so the daughter says to her dad, she says, well, wait a minute, I thought you told me that the uh, lion was the king of the jungle. And he said, I did. So she said, well, then why does the lion get killed? And his answer to her was, the story's going to always end that way until the lion learns how to write. <laughs> so, so I write a lot. <laughs> I mean, like, a whole lot. Hello, I am Kristen Proctor, a Master's of Interior Architecture and Design student from George Washington University. 
Uh, I live in Anacostia, which is in southeast Washington, D.C. And sometimes historic preservation is scary to the members of the community because we find that developers are coming in with these grants from the Historical Society to preserve these buildings, but they are also mainly just developing low-income housing. So for us, in a way, we feel that they are preserving the neighborhood to be a poor neighborhood because that's what's coming in. So I'm not sure, I guess I need to know how are we defining historical preservation, who defines it, and then how are we defining the programming of historical preservation? Yeah, that's a great question. It's all about control. You know, at, at the core of historic preservation, it's real estate development. And when I talked about, uh, or didn't get a chance to speak, about monetizing culture, it's about building more sophisticated organizations that have a, are mission-driven around preserving culture that can access uh, PRIs, that might be able to create a real estate investment trust. You know, what are these really sophisticated uh, real estate models that we can bring to grassroots, on the ground, localized preservation efforts? And that's the way that we take control and ownership of historic preservation. I had a question, I, I, I'm kind of, I'm sorry to take any of the time away from the audience, but um, Unika, I've been, uh, for a very long time, been wondering about um, the quilters of G's Ben and how they could have become um, greater, um, in greater control of the economic windfall of the discovery of their quilts and uh, their place, because it's genuinely an authentic place, um, could have been a cultural tourism. Um, it could have sustained uh, the local community and made them very, very wealthy. And somehow, I don't think that happened. And I'd like to know a little bit about why and whether you think that that's a good thing, uh, because there are a lot of people who appropriated their work um, and, and made their national and international reputations based on the work. And somehow I don't know how much of that trickled down. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are about that one. Yeah, wow, okay. So, hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I was hinting to a little bit of uh, the sort of extraction of cultural production uh, with that story, uh, with G's Ben. And so, Wealthy, so we, wealth creation was good for us as, a, as a, an approach to development um, because we began to open up these other ways of looking at wealth um, in the community. I can't really say from the community's perspective, um, from what I've been told, that it's all um, an outsider situation. I mean, some of, some of the issues that are, um, you know, uh, present in the community in the sense of what it could have and could not is present in any community. It's just about people working together, deciding to come together and plan, deciding to uh, get, get the job done, and really getting serious about business. Um, and so I sit on a different, uh, very, <laughs> I'm trying to really straddle the fence here with uh, honoring what the community has uh, trusted and trusted in me in the sense of being a representative, uh, and also tell the truth. Um, from what I what I know, um, uh, it's complicated. It always is. I mean, you know, right now what's happening in the sense of cultural tourism is that uh, the community is ready to go. So we've been organizing with them uh, about three years now. They didn't originally want to start up a cooperative ownership model or any business around tourism. Um, and so what ended up happening is that the tourism just happens. And uh, people come in and from anywhere, any size group, in any which way that they want. And um, the community's not able to really receive them. They come just to one place, to the Quilt Collective. Well, not everybody in the community quilts, right? There are young children, there are lots of people who could benefit from uh, you guys visiting, right? So we've helped them understand that and worked very closely with them. Uh, through the process to identify the opportunities and also create a model that's sustainable for them anytime they're ready to do it. So I get calls regularly um, about trips and things like that. The bigger thing is that wealth is defined in many ways. 
uh, in one sense, economically. The community doesn't look the way in which people think it should look. Um, there are some real serious issues around education and various types of uh, infrastructure issues that are pressing upon the community. But overall, they're lighting up the world um, with their values, with the love that they have, a very simple lifestyle that people are longing for to experience. And so there are lots of people that just come to the community and are fine with it just the way it is. Um, but there's a lot to learn from that uh, experience. Um, and so I think with what we've together and what other groups are learning is that uh, you know, it's really important to have a vision, to have a community vision, to get organized, to really understand whatever is being presented, to get proper representation on a community level, to understand the value, the full value, not just the value you place on your place yourself, but even how the world is looking in at you. Um, what's motivating people when they come to you for an <coughs> offer, right? And the important is that agricultural heritage. They inherited 10,000 acres as a family. You don't see many places in the, in, in the United States where a whole family of people of African, African descent are living together in an inheritance like that. So they know the value of that and they're working now to get it together, so. Thank you. Welcome. And I think we have time for one more question. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, this is sort of looking at the regional, um, the regional picture. Data has shown, you know, increasingly Americans are moving um, back to cities. It's sort of a reversal of a trend that's, you know, started in the 70s, 60s, 70s. Um, and at the same time as Craig pointed to, you know, cities are more segregated now than they were decades ago. So I'm wondering how the confluence of these two trends, like people movement, you know, regional movement to cities and then also um, segregation, increased segregation within them is affecting the way you see each of your work um, and especially how it relates to black communities. That was that was a that was a one question, but that's not a five minute answer. None of these have been. That question could have been a whole symposium. Um, well, I'll try to make this really really brief. Um, you know, you know that's basically what you're talking about is is a some is a serious level of gentrification mm -hmm. basically. And so I was talking about this uh, earlier today with uh, uh, Sekou, who's here, he's back there somewhere, um, about how do you keep this from happening? Because people, you know, you can't, you, you, neighborhoods need, they need resources, they need resources. So you want people to move in. And so this is a, a really unformed but crazy idea. Um, you, you recall the, um, I guess the, the beginnings of rent control in, in New York. It's like, okay, all the property values, all the things are going up around you in your homes, but you know, some of these things we're gonna sort of keep, keep steady. So we'll have that available for uh, folks who are now basically being priced out or have to move out. Now we know that's been bastardized and, and used in, in a majority of ways that are just not what it was intended for. But what if there was a better system of that in neighborhoods. So say my grandmother's lived in this neighborhood for 30 years, you know, and somehow for some reason she's been able to keep the house up and keep it together. And now people are moving in and the property values are going up and she's on the fixed income and she can't really, you know, can't stay in the home. <clears throat> what if her property, what if her mortgage and her property values were set based on how long she lived in that neighborhood? And so when people come in and the property values go up, she still gets to stay because she's been there for a long time. Now, people will argue, well, you know, she could sell the home and take all that big profit out of that. Well, what if that, what if that profit goes back to the city? Now the city has more money to invest in other places. I get to stay, she gets to stay there as long as she wants. Now she gets to enjoy the benefits of new street lighting that hadn't been there for the last 30 years. And trees, and neighbors, and the whole nine yards. Everybody wins. The people in the neighborhood win, she wins, the city gets a chunk of money, they get to invest in someplace else. Everybody wins. But it requires folks to think differently 
about values. It's not always about money. And we often, folks who these new neighborhoods have been built on their backs, never enjoy the benefits of them, never. So that's what needs to, I think, needs to occur. Figure out a way to those, that those people who are there can now benefit from you know, this interest of people moving back into the city. So anyway. I've seen similar uh, conversations around land management, uh, management of the commons, um, and how there's a truce between stakeholders where um, equity investor, real estate, big time developer, I don't know, buys 10, 20,000 acres at a time, uh, partners with, uh, you know, cooperative landowners or, you know, farmers, for example, and uh, they, they, they work out agreements. These are models that are not necessarily practiced in the United States, but a lot of people are looking uh, at these models to figure out how to address things like uh, encroachment upon land and preservation of large bodies of land and, um, you know, the idea of uh, turning land over forever for perpetuity for organic farming, for example, you know, would be a wonderful idea. You know, um, having a common place where this land could exist for that. Uh, and farmers could just farm the land. I mean, a lot of people want to do that. <laughs> And they don't want to, you know, so if we can find a way. These new structures are being talked about, and people are actually trying to implement them. And I think that's what we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, new models that need to exist. Because at the end of the day, we're all, um, we have realized that, you know, that they have a saying, I think, in, uh, in uh, Cuba, if you hurt, hurt my, my pinky, my whole body hurts. Right? And, uh, you know, the most vulnerable, if you help the most vulnerable, everybody wins. So... Somewhere in there are, are these new opportunities uh, existing. And I'll just add that a colleague of mine, Dale Green from Morgan State University, we've been talking about or brainstorming about real estate development <laughs> models that we can bring to Baltimore. Baltimore has the largest African American historic district in the country. Currently, home ownership is at 6%. Right. So we're thinking that to prevent displacement of that community is an issue around income diversity. And if we can motivate recent college graduates, African-American recent college graduates, to and, and subsidize the cost of the purchase of their first house, that they will take the risk in helping to rebuild their community. It also creates intellectual diversity. Mm -hmm and creates you know, role models and inspirational figures that sometimes are absent in these communities. So. And I don't think it would be one. I mean, it could be these three and 50 others. The, the objective is to not simply think that this is laissez-faire capitalism. That, well, you just can't afford to stay there. This is where people want to live. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's been constructed specifically to starve a neighborhood. Resources have were stolen. They didn't just leave. They were stolen. Federal government helped it happen. Cities helped it happen. It was stolen. Thank you. And so it's not just the way capital moves. It's the way that we allow capital to move. And if we can construct a way that neighborhoods get, I, I, please, this is going to be a bad term, but neighborhoods get raped, we can construct a way to where they become uh, uh, restorative justice. But you have to want it, and you have to value it. And that's, if we don't, this is just going to keep happening over and over and over again. Yes. <laughs> So much for your words, we really appreciate it. Um, if we could, I don't know if you could help me thank them once more for their participation. Okay. So, I'm going to read for you the mission statement of the Kumba Singers. So, I'll read in their voice. Our name, Kumba, embodies our mission and vision to proudly proclaim and celebrate the creativity and spirituality of black people. Kumba strives to do what we can with what we have to leave a better space, 
um, better than we inherited it. This essence permeates our performances, our community work, and the relationships we build with others. This essence is the vision of Kumba singers. Kumba continues to honor its cultural history and the legacy created by our predecessors through our songs we sing and the community involvement that we emphasize today. Whether you are a prospective member, an alumnus, or an avid supporter, we sincerely appreciate you um, being here at the site and supporting our work. Thank you, and here are the Kumba singers. Good afternoon. Um, for our first selection, we'll be singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, um, also known as the Negro National Anthem. And as it is an anthem, we ask that those who are able to please stand as we sing.
just a little while longer hold on just a little while longer hold on just a little Everything will 
Cause everything, everything will be alright. I tell you everything, everything will be alright.
so much to the Kumba Singers. They are a group that's joining us from Harvard College. At this time, I would like to invite Dana McKinney and Azura Cox to the podium to introduce our keynote speakers. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Hi again, just wanted to remind you, I'm Dana McKinney, um, and I'm president of the African American Student U here, Union here at the GSD. Um, my name is Azura Cox, and I'm the vice president of the African American Student Union. Um, Thanks again to everyone for coming and staying. The whole day it's been amazing, and we hope it's been transformative for you as well. Um, so we're happy to finally introduce the keynote speakers for the first annual Black and Design Conference. Um, before doing so, we wanted to say a few words about the format. This keynote will take the form of a conversation between two remarkable individuals, an architect, Phil Freelon, and a creative director, Daryl Crooks. We hope that the interdisciplinary nature of this conversation will shed new light on the topics, questions, and discourse that we have covered across scales today, and ultimately unfold what it means to be black in design. Starting with Phil, Phil Freelon is the founder and president of the Freelon Group. In 2014, Phil joined forces with global architecture and design firm Perkins and Wills he has led multifaceted design teams on museums, libraries, and institutional spaces nationwide. The team of Freelon, Ajay, Bond, Smith Group is leading the design for the Smithsonian's new National Museum of African American History and Culture, currently under construction at the National Mall in Washington, DC. Phil's work has been published in national professional journals, including Architect, professional, sorry, Progressive Architecture, Architectural Record, and Contract Magazine where he was named Designer of the Year for 2008. Phil was a Loeb Fellow here at the GSD and is currently on the faculty, woo, <laughs> and is currently on the faculty at MIT's School of Architecture and Planning, where he was appointed Professor <laughs> of Architecture Practice in 2009. Phil is a Fellow of the American Institute of Architects and the recipient of the AIA, American Institute of Architecture, uh, North Carolina's gold medal. In 2011, President Obama appointed him to the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts. Um, Daryl Crooks is creative director of the award-winning award The Atlantic magazine, where he oversees the art direction across its numerous print and online platforms. Before joining The Atlantic, Daryl worked as creative director of Ebony magazine, where he oversaw the first cover-to-cover -cover redesign in the title's then 66-year-old history and helped redefine the magazine's visual identity. Prior to that, Daryl served as the art director of Esquire magazine, developing design concepts and layouts, conceptualizing, commissioning, and directing photo shoots, and editing photography. Before joining Esquire, he was the uh, associate art director at Complex and Men's Journal. Daryl began his design career at The Source. So please join us in welcoming Phil and Daryl to the stage. Oh, oh, sorry, one quick thing. Uh, there is a reception following today's keynote. If you have a red ticket in your name badge, you got the golden ticket. So please join us in, um, at the reception, which is going to be held at the, at the Cooper Gallery um, at the Hutchins Center. Thank you. That was uh, an amazing performance. Phil and I can't sing that well, so you guys will just have to bear with us. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm Daryl. Uh, first, I just want to clap it up really quick for the AASU for putting this together. Um, and to all the speakers so far, this has been completely, you know, inspiring. So try not to get choked up as well. Uh, you know, usually when I go to these conferences or events, I'm the only black guy in the room, so this is, whew, this is nice. This is nice. Uh, so I work uh, in a bit of a different area of practice than some of the other speakers today. 
Um, I'm an editorial creative director, uh, The Atlantic Magazine in DC. Uh, what that means is I'm responsible for the visual representation of our consumer-facing products, The Atlantic Magazine, uh, TheAtlantic.com, eBooks, apps. But more than that, I'm a visual storyteller. Um, prior to The Atlantic, I worked at the Esquire, where I was doing stuff like this and stuff like that and stuff like that. Uh, after Esquire, I went to Ebony Magazine, <laughs> where I did stuff like that. <laughs> Someone mentioned the, uh, gentleman here, mentioned the aspirational quality of Ebony from back in the day, try to bring that back a little bit. I did stuff like that, piece about uh, DNA exoneration, piece about the Tuskegee Airmen, the surviving Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, then three years ago, I joined the Atlantic. Well, sorry, here's some covers. <laughs> I think you guys know who that is, my man Sam Jackson. <laughs> so three years ago, I joined uh, the Atlantic. For those of you unfamiliar with the Atlantic, this is the very first issue. It was founded in 1857, which means it's really old. Uh, <laughs> 158 years old, to be exact. Uh, it was founded right here in Boston. Um, by writers, poets, people who were considered radicals at the time. They wrote about education, politics, social justice, and abolishing slavery. It's published work by Frederick Douglass. We've seen his, his picture a couple of times. Uh, Ralph Ellison, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, up to today with Nicole Hannah-Jones and of course, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, there's President Obama with a copy of The Atlantic. <laughs> Thanks for reading, big guy. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, my job as creative director is to take these brilliant, nuanced, challenging ideas and figure out how to present them visually, uh, how to tell the story in a way that draws in the reader, uh, whether it's about the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe or the new science of old age. <laughs> uh, and no, that man did not actually do that jump. It's the magic of Photoshop. <laughs> Sorry to ruin the magic. Um, the rise of military spending. Uh, the rise of ISIS. And of course, the case for reparations. Um, how many of you have seen this cover? And how many of you read the piece? Yeah, nice. I was expecting a few hands to go down because it's really long, but. Nice work. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this piece a bit because it is directly related to some of the themes that we've been discussing the past couple of days. Uh, the issues of redlining, uh, housing inequality, spatial segregation. Uh, when people hear the word reparations, they immediately think slavery. And then they say, well, slavery is abolished. My family never owned slaves. It's impossible anyway, so screw it. Uh, but the brilliance of the piece, as many of you know, is that, yeah, it started with slavery, but ta was able to connect the dots from slavery and Jim Crow to Chicago and redlining and the Contract Buyers League. Uh, for those of you who didn't uh, read the piece, the Contract Buyers League was an organization based in North Lawndale, Chicago, uh, that was trying to fight contract selling. Uh, what is contract selling? Basically. Black people in Lawndale and other neighborhoods around the country, like West Baltimore, they thought they were getting a mortgage, they thought they were buying a house, but instead, they were getting a contract. They weren't building equity, they weren't building wealth uh, from their homes. If they missed a payment, they got evicted, uh, and the house was resold. Um, and this was state policy at the time. Um, this created a cycle, pop, a cycle of poverty which leads to abandoned homes and urban blight, another topic that has been discussed. So how do you tell this story? How do you present a story like that to the country, to the public? Um, and I decided I want to do an all type cover. Uh, and I was inspired by this Esquire cover. Um, and 
all you young designers out there, it's okay to be derivative sometimes, so don't, don't sweat it. Um, uh, you know, I was looking for a way to stop people in their tracks, something that would challenge our readers with the facts and something that would, you know, hopefully stand the test of time. Uh, we recognized that this was a risky cover, but we knew the piece was so good that we were willing to go for it. Um, when the issue finally did come out, it was selling out in bookstores. We actually discussed doing a second run of the issue, which is uh, amazing. Um, and it was amazing to see this thing make its way into the world and frankly to see people talking seriously about reparations. Um, obviously, it's not because of the cover alone. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Ta-Nehisi. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to stress to you guys today is the way you present your stories matters. Uh, the way we present ourselves matters. Um, and then when it came to the actual story itself, it was important to me that we show Lawndale. This is not an abstract idea. This is a real place that, that people have to deal with. And frankly, the Atlantic readers are older, mostly affluent white people who are never going to be in North Lawndale. Um, so when you talk about urban blight and abandonment, it's not something that you should have to imagine. It's, you open the magazine and it's right there. Um, what you, what you guys call the built environment actually became uh, the visual story. Housing and urban blight became the manifestation of the state-sanctioned policies that created these conditions for people. You know, what kind of effect does living in that kind of environment have on a person, on a community? What kind of stress is it triggering? Um, this is how it looked online. Uh, and then when it came to the web version, we were able to include infographics and video. We had two short form documentaries um, that our video department produced, things you can't do in a magazine. Uh, these were interactive maps that our developers created from uh, census data dating back all the way to 1960 to 2010. Uh, you can basically go online and compare unemployment and vacancy uh, and race over 60 years in Chicago. You actually see the segregation visually. Um, so we put a lot of resources behind this. Uh, we knew it was an important piece. Everybody at the magazine worked hard on it especially our research department, shout out to the fact checkers uh, back, in, back at the Watergate. Um, we even created a trailer for it uh, that we created with our video department. Uh, where's my man with the, the video? Just wanna show that to you guys really quick. This area here represents the poorest of the poor in the city of Chicago. I've always wanted to own my own house because I worked for white people when I was in the South and they had beautiful homes and I always said one day I was gonna have me one. White folks created the ghetto and it drives me crazy today even that we don't admit that. This is the best example I can think of of institutional racism. Um, so we created that and kind of put it out on social media as a way to promote this piece that we knew was important, was a big deal, um, and we were right. This is our current issue on newsstands now. I don't know if you guys have seen this one yet. Um, again, another piece by Mr. Coates. This one is about mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, even longer than the reparations piece. This one, I think, clocked in at 18,000 words, uh, about 24 pages. It's one of the longest pieces published in the history of the magazine. Uh, but ta did reporting in Baltimore and Detroit, uh, met with families who've been affected by mass incarceration. This is Patricia Lowe and her family. Her son is doing a life sentence. Uh, but much like the reparations cover, I wanted this to be confrontational. Uh, but instead of the words, it was all in the faces of this family. Um, they're tired, they're stressed, stressed yet resilient. Um, I mean, even the baby on the right is just the most intense <laughs> baby like ever. Uh, 
I kept the type to a minimum here uh, to let the image do the talking. And it's such a powerful image. Um, you know, and I really pushed, first of all, to feature these people in the magazine, but then I pushed even harder to put them on the cover of the magazine because it's not an abstract idea. These are the people who are affected by mass incarceration. It's not about a uh, symbolic picture of hands on, a, on, on prison bars. These are the people that are dealing with it. Um, here are some spreads from the inside. Clara Newton uh, with a picture of her son who's doing life in prison. Um, that's Baltimore, the Gilmore Homes where Freddie Gray was arrested. Um, that's not Freddie Gray being arrested, that, uh, another uh, gentleman. Um, you know, Kwame uh, mentioned Detroit earlier and the abandoned homes and, and buildings. That's it. <laughs> you don't have to imagine this stuff. This is what people are dealing with and, and uh, living with day to day. So the environment became part of the story. The built environment, the buildings became this manifestation again of disenfranchisement. Uh, these are the people that are dealing with it in Detroit. Uh, Yousef Shakur on the left, Carl Taylor on the right, uh, community activist and uh, sociologist at MSU. Um, so I try to shed light visually on these problems to help the reader better understand the problems. Um, this is Newark, New Jersey. These are not models. This is an actual stop and frisk happening. Um, and you can see again, the abandoned buildings uh, kind of looming over people's lives. So my job is to show you, help you understand, help tell the story. So when you read a piece about redlining or uh, mass incarceration or stop and frisk, you can see the effect and more importantly, you can see who it affects. Um, Webster defines design as a plan uh, to make decisions about something that is being built or created, uh, to create the plans and drawings that show how something will be made. But design is more than that. Uh, design can make people feel happy. It can feel, make people feel angry or feel safe. And as designers, you have that power, whether it's through architecture, urban planning, culinary arts, or editorial design, you have the power to tell a narrative from a different perspective than what is out there now. And when a design is used to its full potential, it can completely change the narrative. And in some cases, it can change lives. The way you tell the story matters. And frankly, design matters. Thank you. Oh, that was excellent, Daryl. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by thanking the AASU for the honor of being able to address you today. Um, and for me, it's somewhat of a full circle. I started my architectural training at Hampton Institute, now Hampton University. Went on to uh, NC State University, then MIT, then here, Harvard, to get uh, the Loeb Fellowship. And it was that moment um, in finishing the fellowship that was a pivotal point for me because I decided to leave the firm that I was with, the majority firm. I was a young guy, 35 years old, vice president there, and um, good position, company car, you know, credit cards. <laughs> Take two-thirds cut in pay and start my own firm, the Freeline Group. That was in 1990. And I made some choices at that point in time. I decided there were going to be some projects that I just wouldn't work on, which led me to other projects that were much more fulfilling and actually made a positive impact on the um, the environment and the neighborhoods. So there were no prisons, uh, no strip shopping centers, no casinos, um, you know, a very, very simple bar. If we couldn't walk away from that project feeling good about what we had done as architects, we weren't interested in doing the work. And so 25 years later, you know, people, we, we, um, we're doing the kind of work that I think is, uh, is meaningful and we're certainly proud of. So let's, uh, let's look at some of that before we Move on. Which button is it? Okay. okay, great. Starting with the um, center 
International Center for uh, Civil Rights in Greensboro. This is uh, my home state now. I've been living there longer than anywhere else. And this is where the sit-ins took place. Um, and you have the four freshmen from North Carolina A&T State University who uh, organized and had the courage to go in um, in 1960 and, uh, and sit in. And so this project is not only about the event and the time and that issue, but the building itself uh, is an artifact. And rest restoring the, um, the Art Deco facade, uh, getting F.W. Woolworth, who's now out of business, to come and, and put the sign back in. It's about remembering. We want people to remember what happened uh, back then. <clears throat> and integrating um, you know, traditional details in the ceiling and, uh, you know, dental mold and so on with contemporary uh, materials and forms to lead the people down uh, an escalator to the exhibits, which some of them, quite frankly, are, are, are uh, very moving, um, very difficult, uh, including the uh, Emmett Till uh, story uh, down below. But the the main part of the exhibit, again, is architectural. As you come up and through the exhibits, you arrive at the actual lunch counter where these young men uh, had the courage to sit and take all sorts of abuse. And, um, and using technology, video, uh, and also very traditional means of storytelling with um, you know, flat work, you get to sit there and, and experience a, a bit of what took place uh, back at that time and the architecture becomes the artifact. And for us, the building should tell a story, whether it's the historic building, such as this one, or, or new buildings. This is the Gantt Center in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is downtown Charlotte. They call it uptown there. I'm wondering if there's a pointer. Yeah, here it is. Here's the NBA arena, the football stadium, NFL, the central business district with uh, the Charlotte is basically the banking center of the south, southeast. Um, and there's a new area that had been developed as a cultural district there. Um, and we found in our research that there used to be a neighborhood um, there. And unfortunately, it's a, it's a similar story around the country. Two things happen. Um, you know, the traditional neighborhoods uh, are forced out as the downtown grows, and they call it urban renewal. The second thing that typically happens is the highway blasts through um, and destroys everything. And this neighborhood uh, was the African-American neighborhood called Brooklyn. And you'll see that bar right here. We'll come back and talk about that site, which, which was one of a number of sites in Charlotte. Um, very difficult, 55 feet by 400 feet. But it was in a good location, and we'll talk a bit about that. I want to come back to the neighborhood as well. But this area, and our site again is in red, uh, had the advantage of being in a cultural district where there, was other, there were other things going on, other architectural significant uh, projects. And so we felt that, um, that being in the midst of other uh, institutions that are uh, culturally based would be a good thing as opposed to being in the hood or, or somewhere removed because the stories and the the art being displayed is something for everyone, not just the African-American community. The site is long and narrow because it is a ramp system that feeds 10 stories of parking below a uh, mega tower, uh, mixed use development. And you enter, cars enter in the middle of the site, trucks enter at the end of the site, and there are two parallel ramps, one on top of the other. Back to the neighborhood. Uh, as typical in the South, um, you know, from the 20s on through the 60s, uh, you had vibrant standalone communities uh, with their own theaters, hotels, professionals, very proud uh, African-American communities uh, where education was, was stressed. And in our research, we found the Meyer School here, uh, which was nicknamed the Jacobs Ladder School. People would come uh, during graduations and other events and have their picture taken. And we think the Jacob's Ladder reference certainly is bi biblical, but also uh, we think it represented the value placed on education in this community. So this building obviously is gone, the whole community is gone. But we wanted to find a way to imbue meaning into uh, the new building uh, and have it some way pay reference and homage to the community that was there. 
We also looked at quilting patterns um, as a launch point for the facade studies, uh, African textile patterns. Not in a literal way to say, okay, let's wrap this in Kenny cloth, but, but you know, to, <laughs> to say, uh, you know, there's a tradition in the African American community of making something out of nothing, taking pieces and making something beautiful. And so we have this very difficult site um, that we want to take the pieces and try and make it beautiful. So the partee, if you will, or the diagram, is a building that's lifted up on Jacob's Ladder to get you to the main floor with the parking ramps below uh, wrapped in a uh, skin, a high performance rain screen. It's very sustainable, by the way. Um, and what do you do with the long and skinny building? I, I won't get into the plans too much, except to say that uh, on the back side, um, that's a party wall. And so there's going to be a building there at some point. You can't put windows there. So what do you do? You put the stairs, the bathrooms, things that don't need or want windows. Here's the ramp down for the cars, trucks. And at the top of the escalator and top of the stair, you have your, your lobby which doubles as an event space. And then as you move up in the building, the galleries can take the full depth of the, of the site. I have to say that the, the client here, um, the board and the stakeholders were, you know, they were saying, well, here we go again. We're getting the short end of the stick. Why can't we have a, a nice site, you know, that isn't difficult, that, that is easy to build on? Um, and they gave us a chance to to work it out, and we were able to, um, to convince them that this is an opportunity for a billboard into the city. So as you look across the freeway, uh, we have the entry point into the downtown in the midst of the cultural district. And here's the entrance with the escalator. The stairs come in from the other side. The atrium is in the center. Cars enter. We try to disguise that, but there's a ramp down that we talked about. And there's a commissioned piece of art um, that blocks and, and uh, shields the, the truck ramp. And even on the back side, to continue the motif uh, of the quilting pattern and a light sculpture um, that wraps the other side of the building, no, no back side to the building at all. And so with the idea of quilting, you're making something out of nothing. This terrible site becomes a beautiful space uh, for the community. Um, and is doing very well in Charlotte. And at the top of Jacob's Ladder, you, you enter the gallery spaces. There are no corridors, so you can get the full depth of the building. And when you're in the galleries, it feels quite uh, right proportionally, um, as the galleries have the right uh, aspect ratio. The National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, this was a design competition. And you know, we wanted once more to, uh, to make the building be meaningful beyond just a pretty or, or a beautiful uh, structure. We felt that the building could help tell the story. And um, of course, the, the interlocking arms that we, we see from Dr. King and, and the civil rights movement is something that even continues today in uh, human rights movements around the world. Um, and a place for action whether it's Tiananmen Square or the Arab Spring or Washington Monument, this would be a place for people to come uh, and take action toward um, you know, advancing and protecting civil and human rights uh, around the world, telling the stories, but also understanding that human rights and slavery and uh, oppression is happening every day in this country and around the world. So the site are these caressing arms, if you will, not, not a literal expression, but we want people to think about uh, what they're seeing and, and try and figure it out. And, and um, you know, it's, it's a way of, of subtly suggesting the, the, uh, the arms or hands that are caressing the precious content. This plaza level is 20, level, 20 feet above the lower level. And so we're connecting that with a swooping staircase, exterior uh, terrace landscape. And these are your places for action. Lots of studies about how those walls would be formed, how they would be clad, color, windows, fenestration. The building opened a little over a year ago and um, is doing very well. This is the uh, grand promenade down and around the curving facade. And uh, programs can occur outdoors as well. 
There is a commissioned <clears throat> sculpture by Larry Kirkland from uh, Washington, D.C., with uh, quotes from Dr. King and Nelson Mandela as water is streaming down over the words you stand and, and look at that. Inside, the exhibitry comes out into the lobby space. And so we, we don't want simply a threshold where, okay, now you're in the building, then you move to exhibits. It's a constant flow and an integration of the story into the building. And one of those moments of uh, taking action happening on the lower plaza. Someone mentioned they were from Anacostia. We, we did the uh, new library there. Um, it's in southeast Washington, D.C., the African-American neighborhood. And when you look at that neighborhood, there's commercial development here um, on Good Hope Road. But then it quickly morphs into a residential neighborhood where the scale of the architecture changes and gets smaller. And so with a building, fairly sizable building, 22,000 square feet, we wanted to find a way to respect the, the homes and not just put a, a monumental building there um, in, a, in a block, so to speak, and to also respect the legacy trees and, and uh, make the landscape a learning opportunity for, for the children in the neighborhood. So the idea is to um, really wrap the building with the roof. This is a western exposure, so we had to control that sunlight because um, the building pretty much had to lay out this way. There was a the existing temporary library was here that had to be in place until this was open. So we were forced into a north-south orientation which gave, gave us a long western facade and a, potentially a lot of heat gain. So we're using the roof to control that. We're breaking the program into pavilions, smaller blocks of space to relate to the smaller scale of housing adjacent. And so we have the green roof, which is also a green roof. <laughs> and you know, uh, it's a long, low building, so we have this vertical element as well that, that is uh, a beacon. It, uh, it glows at night. And, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes about, from one of my favorite artists, James Brown, is make it funky. So we, we try to do that. <laughs> and uh, you can sense the, the roof coming through on the inside of the space. Um, the reading room is, is one big space, and the pavilions come off to the side. There are, there are skylights. And the daylighting is, is controlled uh, as that roof turns down, it's right at the horizon line. So the direct light is doppled and filtered through perforated metal uh, screen. And the books and people are protected uh, from the glare. President Obama came uh, to this library, and I hope he's paying attention because he's about to build one of his own. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And this is the place he decided to, to launch his um, a child literacy uh, program. And we were proud that uh, he chose our library to do it. And um, just a quick side note, uh, they changed half of the glass in the building, the bulletproof glass, for just a two-hour session with the president. Uh, that's how serious the uh, security is there. So the National Museum, I'm going to close with this one, and then we can start our discussion. Um, this was the, or is, the collaboration between myself, David Ajay, Davis Brody Bond, Max Bond, many of you know him or have heard of him, recently deceased uh, in the Smith Group. Now, no one starts out saying, let's have a four architect team and try and do a building. <laughs> so uh, I'll just explain very quickly that um, Max Bond and I were hired to do the programming for this facility, which is the pre-design work. Before you start design, there has to be um, a roadmap and, and uh, a guide to how that's done. It was a 1,200-page document. Um, we were hired because we've done it in the past for all of our libraries. Uh, Max has done, had done a lot of good work. And right around the end of that, that process, uh, the design competition for this started. David Ajay called, and we met with him and said, okay, you know, let's, let's team up. That, that accounts for three architects. Um, and the Smith Group joined because they had um, helped the Smithsonian through the uh, the Indian uh, Museum, which was uh, a problem. They fired the architect, and Smith Group kind of took over. So they were very highly regarded. Well, the site couldn't be more prominent and important. Uh, 14th and Constitution, literally, within the shadow of the Washington Monument. 
the views to and from the site very significant. And this site is also at a turning point, a transition from the very, or, uh, the very orthogonal, rectilinear uh, mall, and then the more free-flowing Mo Washington Monument grounds, where the uh, architecture and landscape architecture is, is more organic. So our landscape picks up on, on those, those curves, and the building is square, like our most important neighbor. Um, and thinking about this, and you know, this is a collaboration including the director, uh, Lonnie Bunch, who's been great. But we, we knew we didn't want the building to be about, only about victims and perpetrators. I mean, certainly the, the struggles are part of our story. We have to tell the truth. But it's also about celebration, um, resilience. There are African references. This is called a karyatid, which is... Um, from Yoruban architecture, very similar to the Western notion of a column, has a base, a body, and a capital, which is a crown or corona. Um, there are southern references, the porch, the idea that you're providing shelter and shade on the south side of the building. And it's also a welcoming point where this building is, is for everyone. It's not just for African Americans, about African Americans. It's this quintessential American story, as Lonnie Bunch would say. And so that porch becomes an important element to pick up on. Uh, and so the building, once again, is, is imbued with meaning. It's not just a, a pretty wrapper around exhibits. The Surrette session with, uh, with David, you know, uh, picked up on this idea of the karyatid and the crown of the corona, uh, creating the, the shroud or the uh, protection around the precious uh, exhibits inside. And so the building is a three-tiered corona with a porch on the southern side of the building. Um, the corona itself is uh, an important form. The, the angle here is 17 and a half degrees, which matches the capstone of the Washington Monument, which is the pyramid, sort of turned the other way around. So there's a subtle reference to our most important neighbor. Uh, the porch is that welcoming moment with a reflecting pool, some of the water moving on a, on a diagonal, others water still. But the uh, microclimate that's created by the breezes um, help to cool the entrance as you move into the building. Half of the building is below grade. Um, if we put all of it above ground, it would have been way too massive. Uh, plus, there are, there are moments and functions in the, in the museum that don't want or need natural light. Yet and still, we, we, we bring, this is one level down. This is a contemplative space uh, where um, perhaps after seeing exhibits that are, uh, that are moving, um, you can sit and, and think about that water, flowing water, um, suggest spirituality, cleansing. The History Gallery has some fairly large artifacts, including a Pullman train car, a segregated car. Uh, a Tuskegee Airman aircraft will be hung in the history gallery as well. This is one level down. You can see that when you look at the atrium uh, above each of the levels of the corona, there's a skylight. So light is coming in vertically, but also horizontally. Models, lots of models. And it was mentioned before about the ironwork in places like Charleston and, and New Orleans, Savannah. Yes, uh, and, and this beautiful gilding uh, was done by enslaved and, and freed Africans and African Americans, uh, and we picked up on that. And you know, the pattern in the corona is a modern uh, geometric uh, computer interpretation of the florets and, and twigs and other constituent forms that, that make up this beautiful ironwork. That, by the way, provided shade uh, and also beauty in a, in a hot climate. And we variegate the, uh, the openings from uh, nearly opaque to nearly transparent uh, to, uh, first of all, privilege certain views out of the building to the, our important uh, surrounding monumental uh, structures, but also to um, regulate light and heat gain uh, where it's needed. A full-scale mock-up was built, and this is just one tier. The building is three tiers of corona. Uh, and so not only to test the uh, thermal and um, water performance, but also the aesthetic uh, feel of what's happening, which was very beautiful. 
And the building's corona is actually finished. If you go to Washington, D.C. now, the building's buttoned up. We have another 11 months of work uh, to finish the exhibits and, uh, and the landscape. Um, but we're well on our way. And um, let's move to the question and answer phase. Thank you. Sing now or Daryl? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, well, that was amazing. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm an editorial designer. I don't know about this world of architecture. Uh, I mean, my first question to you is how did you get here? <laughs> like, how did you get to this point? What made you want to become an architect as? A young, young man. Well, you know, I, I imagine this is a very similar story for a lot of the people in the room, but uh, I, I was inclined toward drawing and, and making models and things as a child, uh, and, and art was prominent in my family. Uh, my grandfather was a, a painter in, during the Harlem Renaissance period, so I was surrounded by art. I always thought I would be kind of a, an industrial artist or a painter or something, but in high school I discovered design. I went to high school in Philadelphia, Central High School, which is what you'd call a, um, a magnet school now. And so they had programs in drafting and design. And I, I found it to be, uh, for me, uh, the perfect blend of uh, art and science, because uh, I also loved um, geometry, math, physics, okay. and those sorts of things. So I um, hadn't met an architect until I got to college, right. black, white, or otherwise. So right. uh, it's a very small profession. Right. Um, I mean, you're right, it is probably a similar kind of uh, entry into this profession. Much like you, I was into drawing, uh, but I thought I was going to be a comic book illustrator. <laughs> that would have been fun. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was all about comic books and hip-hop for me. Uh, and then, uh, you know, ended up at School of Visual Arts and, you know, my dad being uh, West, Indian, West Indian, Jamaican, uh, <laughs> Jamaican's in the house. <laughs> Told him I was going to be an illustrator. He's like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be drawing pictures of people in Central Park. <laughs> you better learn how to use a computer. So I said, all right. Um, and then moved on to my next love, which was hip hop. And I was like, I'm going to be a graphic designer, design CD covers. Um, and I was a big fan of the Source magazine back in those days. So I ended up taking this editorial design class um, where I basically made a fake Source magazine. <laughs> and uh, I was working at this job and one of the designers actually ended up working at the Source and they said, we're looking for an assistant designer. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> this is amazing. You know, because I used to walk around with the Source magazine. So it was kind of like a combination of comic books in some way, a magazine and, 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 uh, and music. And then uh, the rest is history, I guess. I don't know. Um, I want to ask you specifically about the Smithsonian African American History Museum. Because, you know, I've been, I'm in DC now, I've been to the mall and when you get there, it's almost, it's so different from everything else on the mall. Everything's got this kind of neoclassic, kind of Roman-inspired architecture. And then you get to this very kind of soulful, organic-looking structure. Um, how difficult was it for you and the rest of the designers to push something like that through? Like, was how many levels of bureaucracy? I imagine it's a big deal to put something like that on the National Mall. How difficult was it? it well, in a few words, it was incredibly difficult. <laughs> and and uh, there, there are many review agencies, many levels of scrutiny um, 
both formal and, and informal. You know, there were people who didn't want the building there or didn't want the building at all. But then there were the uh, regulatory agencies like the National Capital Planning Commission, mm -hmm. the Commission of Fine Arts, the um, Historic Preservation Office, the wow. um, Park Service. Wow. E even even <laughs> the Secret Service was involved wow. because there are sight lines <laughs> to the White House, and you know they were concerned about snipers getting on the yeah. roof. And so, wow. uh, <laughs> if, if, these it, are things I do not have to think about. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> There, there were Snipers. many, many, I mean, um, it's never come up in editorial meeting. getting a design like that through uh, took a lot of patience and, and a lot of convincing, right? Yeah. You have to be persuasive uh, and passionate about what you're doing um, so that people understand. And, and it, quite frankly, changed. It evolved as a How result. How long was the process, like, from beginning? Well, you got 11 months still, I guess, to go. Yeah. Well, How we long should, did we you guys take uh, designing, planning? We, we started... Uh, we were hired in 2009. Wow. So okay. we're year number six, <laughs> six or seven years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the regulatory process was, was <laughs> <laughs> it really did take a while. And, and I mentioned the building being mostly or half underground. It didn't start that way. Right. So uh, wow. we, I won't say we were forced, but um, being in such a prominent uh, position in the monumental core, yeah. uh, we couldn't have a building that was much bigger than it is right now. And plus, there are height limits in Washington. You can't build above uh, 95 or so feet. Right. We're right at that limit. Okay. <laughs> you know, there are setbacks. Yeah. Um, so it, it took a long while to evolve the competition-winning scheme to what you see today. But the the idea of the corona has prevailed. And yeah. We've been able to sell that to right. uh, the agencies. And in fact, now I'm on I'm on one of those. I'm on, on the Commission of Fine Arts. So it's nice to be a, on the other side of the table. <laughs> Has that been the most challenging project in your career? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh, but my career is not over. Right, uh, right, right. And, and so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and the architects in the room will, will nod when I say that, that what we do can be excruciating at times and difficult but it's also the most rewarding profession that I could imagine being in. Um, and, you know, if you, when you answer the call, it's sort of in your blood. You, you, you're born to do it. And, and it's, um, so those obstacles are simply opportunities to, um, to move, move the project forward. And right. you persevere and you, uh, you work through all the challenges. I think that's a great place to maybe end and go to questions from the audience. Uh, hi. Um, so my question is, in the design of uh, the World Trade Center Museum, there is a specific planning to put more difficult stories off of main pathways. So to coordinate the, the um, design so that you challenge by choice in terms of difficult memories. So my question for both of you in both editorial and in architecture is, do you think about forefronting certain memories, forefronting celebration as opposed to tragedy, or do you try to put both of these stories, both of these narratives on equal footing? I'll start. I think it's a balance, definitely. And part of the team, and there's a, there's a member of that team here today, is, is the curatorial uh, component of the exhibitry. And so uh, there, there's a whole team of people that, that wrestle and grapple with, with those issues. Uh, and I know that um, the philosophy has been to tell the truth, first and foremost. And so you don't want to sugarcoat things. You don't want to hide difficult stories, uh, nor do you want to... Um, only focus on uh, the the negative, and, and so the the, the uh, goal is to is to achieve that balance, where um, folks who are going through the museum are getting the the whole story, not just a part or a, a sanitized version. Um, I would say editorially, uh, uh, I'd really try to. Um, not avoid the tragedy. Um, showing the tragedy gets 
unfortunately, the better result. Um, keeping it honest, and you know, it's reflected in the writing as well, but just keeping it honest and, and like Phil said, searching for the truth. I do the same thing with the images. I search for the truth in the images. I try to avoid, you know, illustration, photo illustration, wherever I can. If it's a piece about a prison, if it's a piece about, uh, you know, reparations, it's a piece about stop and frisk. My first question to the editors is, how can I get a photographer there? Um, it's important to show the truth and, you know, regardless of, of whether it's, it's happy or sad. Um, I think that's um, the most uh, effective journalism is done that way. of how you use, I have a question for both of you because in two different in instances you spoke about how you say use the digital to enhance the analog. So in your case it was giving us this story which was in magazine format but then there was this digital format that allowed you to introduce the trailer and then also these infographics that would in, sort of almost enhance the telling of the story. And in your case, it was this sense of understanding the presence of the lunch counter, but also having that informed by this sort of digital media process. And so I'm wondering for you both, as you struggle to sort of mediate and tell that story, how you wrestle with, say, the digital not almost superseding or almost overtelling the story or writing a new narrative, how you wrestle with that in those projects you presented, but maybe also others. Uh, well, that's an excellent question. I mean, uh, any magazine today, digital is just as important as the print product. Uh, it's just the way it is. You're reaching a bigger audience that way. Um, it is a challenge um, to make sure the integrity is kept from the transition from, from print to digital. But at the same time, you can do so much more with digital than you can do with the print. Like you said, the trailer, infographics, these are things you cannot do in print. With, so it, you know, it, it's a plus in every way, because um, it's helping tell the story. And it's helping tell the story to people who might not be able to get the story, people who don't have access to the magazine, or who don't have six ninety nine to pay for it. Uh, it's all free online, but people still buy it, but there are people who can't buy it. So I think it's just part of the nature of <coughs> of our time and of the industry, and I think it's a beautiful thing. I, I agree, uh, and it is all about the story, and, and digital uh, or technology is one way to tell the story, and what we've found in our work is that um, a blending of, of the low-tech and the high-tech is a good way to go um, for a number of reasons. Now, let's think about youngsters. I mean, if you, if you want your museum to be successful, you have to attract young people. And they're, they're just not going to walk up to, uh, you know, a, a mannequin in a box and, and read a, a card, you know. Nor are they going to um, resonate with technology that they can get on their phone. Why go to the museum if I can do this on my phone? So, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about and coordinate very closely with the exhibit designers who have uh, a very heavy uh, involvement in the technological side of things. You know, how do you engage people and, uh, and still keep it uh, personable. You, you want the technology in a way to be transparent. You, know, you, you want to you be excited and, and, and understand the story, but you don't want to be thinking about, well, there's the computer and there's, there's the uh, projector and uh, there's something else, uh, there's another piece of machinery here. No, those things should be invisible and transparent. It's okay to be wowed by a, a hologram, but it's all, it's, it comes back to the story. And so, uh, it's going to be uh, that, that blending of the two, I think, and, and, and also to make sure that your building is flexible enough to accommodate new technologies that we're not using yet or don't know about. And so we, we're careful to make sure that the infrastructure and backbone of, the, of these uh, museum structures can accommodate things we don't know about yet because, believe me, there's something coming. By the time you build that building, especially in our case, it takes six, seven, eight years, you know, the technology is totally different yeah. from the day one when you started. So we have to be flexible in that way. 
Hi, um, I just wanted to refer to yesterday's panel discussion about pedagogy, and so I'm curious if both of you can kind of share what are some of the things you learned maybe in school and class that today continue to inform your practice or some of the things you felt like you weren't equipped with from school? And then sort of can you share the lessons that you've learned from practice, from working in the real world, from navigating either by virtue of being black in design, by virtue of being a man, uh, by working in the digital industry or in architecture, uh, you know, any of those lessons or hard lessons you're willing to share. Right. That's, about, hey, wow. that's about five or ten yeah. different questions. Right? <laughs> <laughs> By the time I finish one, I'll forget what the first one was. But um, let's see. Um, pedagogy. Well, you know, I came along in the 70s, and uh, David Lee knows this. He, he was here. Uh, you don't get a lot of, um, you didn't in that time, get a lot of diversity in the history of architecture. So it was mostly Western-based and any, anything we wanted to learn uh, beyond that, you kind of had to do on your own. So those of us who were curious went to the library and studied other, other uh, ways of, of, of appreciating built form. Um, and then as you get out in the world, you saw the research we did on these projects. You know, you, you, you have the prerogative as an architect to um, bring to your client ideas. You know, that's part of why they hire you. And so they expect you to be imaginative and to pull in references, at least our clients do, and we, we hope that that we can um, you know come to the table with with fresh and new ideas. Now, as far as uh, coming along in a profession that's only two percent African American, um, I, I try not to dwell on the difficulty. Some the other guy said he's angry all the time. Well, I'm happy all the time. I, <laughs> I, I'm I'm, the, I'm this eternal optimist, and and so we look at. Uh, our stature in the profession as, as being uh, an advantage. Why? Because we're noticed. If everyone else is a white guy and we walk into the room, we've got women and we've got black folks and we've got Hispanic, you know, right, right away, that's a distinction that, that draws positive attention to what we're doing. And our clients, most often, especially in the public sector, you know, if it's a school board or a, uh, you know, a city council or, you know, that they're going to have a demographic very similar to us, we resonate with a client who might be turned off by the homogeneous uh, firm that's coming in right after us or before us. So we, we've found ways to, um, to try and, and leverage our distinction uh, and, and try not to focus on, well, you know, there aren't many of us out here. Um, and we want to do something about that, sure. We want to make sure our numbers increase, but we, we can't let, you know, if I felt 25 years ago that Starting a firm, I could never do this kind of work because it's going to be too difficult. And you know, I'm just an optimist. And I, I always felt that we could we could compete with the star architects if we were given a chance. Okay, and so we we we've, we've had a few wins in that in that arena, um, and that's just the way I think about it. Um, as far as lessons learned, I think the one lesson I've learned throughout my career is that sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to have conviction in your own ideas and uh, and kind of make your case. Sometimes people don't understand what you're thinking, where you're going with something until you show them. Um, that's very true of editorial. Um, sometimes they don't understand something until you explain to them, no, this, this, this is how it works and this is more powerful than this other direction. Um, as far as being a black man in, uh, you know, in the same situation as you guys as architects, probably 2%, if maybe even less than that, uh, editorial designers, much less creative directors of, of national magazines. I mean, I, I can't think of another one. Uh, it's, it's a problem, and it's a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, there's a pipeline issue uh, with black talent. Um, uh, discovering black talent, getting young black talent involved in design and editorial design. Uh, it's an issue. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I take my position as a black man, uh, as a creative director, very seriously. The significance of me working on 
a national magazine cover story about reparations is not lost on me at all. Um, so I embrace that when I can, but at the same time, I have to design for everybody, black, white, Asian, Latino, young, old. Um, so try not to get caught up in it, but at the same time, appreciate it and, and uh, hope that uh, it inspires other people. I want to pick up on something Daryl said about the pipeline. And it's especially a challenge for, for the architectural profession um, because there are so few of us, I'm talking about African-American architects, um, children coming along don't, don't imagine themselves in that career, right? And so, uh, but when you think about our, our training, you have to know you want to be an architect day one when you apply to school. You, you just can't just show up at Harvard in the middle of your sophomore year and decide to change your major or something. So what, what we try and do is, um, is get into the elementary schools, the middle schools, and the high schools uh, and, and talk about architecture and how great it is because you've got to get young people excited so that they understand how to, how to get into the, um, the institutions uh, because it's regulated, right? You've got to have a, an accredited degree in order to get, take the exam and all the rest of it that you know about. And so the, the trick and the key is getting young people to learn and, and get excited about this profession. Uh, and until we do that, the numbers are gonna be low. And that's why whenever I have a chance to do something like this, or even more importantly, in the mainstream, uh, or in a high school or something, I always say yes or send someone from the office to go do it. Whenever a mother calls and says, you know, I've read about you in the paper, will you speak to my daughter? Yes, bring them to the office. Yes, 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 every time. Um, and in that way, you know, maybe we'll find our, our Miles Davis, you know, where's where our um, Alvin Ailey, right? You know, m many of the other arts are, are influenced far more by African Americans in our culture than architecture is right now. So I'm, I'm always asking the question, wh where's our, um, you know, superstar? You know, because we're, the world is, is missing out on some incredible talent because they're doing something else. They, they weren't channeled in the architecture. This sort of piggybacks on, on exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm Meg from Detroit. I work in participatory design. I'm also an artist and have worked a lot in public schools in, in the city. And I guess my question is, we talked a lot about process. And um, I guess my, my main question is, you know, I, I've worked a lot with kids and see them drawing. And how do we... How do, we, how do we get them to that point? And I guess my main question is to, to see that a ta Coats cover like you created started with a guy that was drawing and that a building like this started with a guy that was also drawing and those two things are related. How do we create that, that, that link for kids? How do we create that link? And I guess, again, going back, do, you, do the two of you still draw? Is that where you start in your process? I guess that was my initial question. Do you guys still draw? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, we still draw. Uh, more of it's on the computer, but I, we still sketch. And, and um, you know, the. Why don't you start? <laughs> well, only when I have to, for me. Uh, I still read comic books, but I don't draw as much anymore. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's still it's it, it's an important tool. But um, you know, I would encourage the kids to get on a computer, um, realize that uh, the computer is a tool, but the creativity comes from them, it comes from their hands, it comes from their minds. It doesn't come from the computer. Um, and I think that's where it starts, and I think that's where it started for me, was making that leap from you know, life drawing class to graphic design class and kind of merging those things together. Yeah, here's what I wanted to say about education, primary school education. <clears throat> And you know, years ago, art teachers were taken out of the schools. They aren't there very much anymore. And so uh, that's, a, that's a travesty, because uh, if, you do, if you do have a child that's inclined to draw, where's the encouragement? Where's the, the learning and the teaching about that? It's just so sad. I mean, and, and dance is taken out. And you know, a lot of the arts have been stripped out of our public school education system. And uh, so it makes it more difficult now, 
you know, when I was in school, everybody took gym, you know, everybody had an art class, and those things aren't happening now. Yeah, I mean, it's important to nurture that creativity. I mean, whatever way possible. Um, it's, it's, it's a way to build confidence for kids, and, you know, that's where I got my confidence as a young man, just, it's like almost having a superpower, <laughs> being an artist. Uh, so whatever you can do to keep that going, then it'll lead them to something else, whether it be architecture, editorial design, or coding, or whatever, but it will lead somewhere, or it'll lead to, to drawing. Um, but it's an awesome foundation that should be encouraged. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Maurice. I came here from Atlanta. I have a podcast called Revision Path where I review yeah. and interview black designers from all around the world, designers, developers, etc. cetera. Uh, question to both of you. Throughout your respective design journeys, who have been the people that have inspired you to keep going? Huh. You better take that one first. I'll I got to think. I got to think. <laughs> Um, I mentioned I was from Philadelphia, and I never met this gentleman, but um, there was an architect named Julian Abel, who was also from Philadelphia. Uh, and he went to University of Pennsylvania, an African-American man, in the 20s, the 1920s. Uh, and I live in Durham, North Carolina, which is where Duke University is. And Julian Abel was the principal designer for the main campus and many of the other buildings there. <clears throat> so when I was in undergraduate school down the road in Raleigh, I found out about this, this gentleman and did a research paper. And what was inspiring to me, you know, how could I complain in, in the 70s and 80s about how difficult things were when this, this guy was doing it in, in the 1920s and 30s uh, and was the lead designer for a majority firm, Trimbauer Associates in Philadelphia, who did work here on campus as well, the Widener Library, as Julian Abel Design. So there, there were people that, um, historically, that, that I could look to and say, wow, they, they could do it. Maybe, maybe I can make a career out of this. And of course, there are other mentors along the way. One of them sitting right here. David Lee was teaching at MIT when I was there. Can you imagine that? He was a young guy. Wasn't much older. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, sadly, there were, there were more black folks at MIT then than there are now. Uh -huh. Same is true. Well, I, I think Harvard's doing much better now. Uh, and so, yeah, when I was at Hampton, a guy named John Spencer was the uh, department head there. And he actually encouraged me to move on to uh, a larger institution. And, and you know, he, he was uh, a member of NAAB, the accreditation board, so he knew all the other deans and, and uh, put me into that network. And uh, it, was, it was incredible to have someone like that uh, advocate for you. So there, there have been, and of course, my father. My father was a great guy. Uh, he wasn't a designer. I didn't know any architects. But he was a business person in, a, in marketing. So he had that kind of personal connection. I could watch him deal with people and learned a lot about business and interpersonal relationships professionally from him. So I've had great, great mentors along the way. Yeah, that was a good answer. <laughs> uh, can I say my dad, too? It was cool. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, like most of us, uh, like Phil, you know, my dad uh, was probably the earliest and biggest influence on my life and is teaching me about paying attention, uh, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, um, don't cut corners, work hard. Um, and that was the philosophy that I think kind of guided me throughout my career. Um, as far as specific people, uh, I can't think of one specific person, but you know, I mentioned uh, you know, uh, music packaging, CD art, and those guys were like my heroes growing up uh, in high school. Uh, you know, like the Say Adams of the world, drawing board, uh, you know, Miguel Rivera, who, uh, did the Raekwon album cover, like these were, <laughs> these were like my design heroes and uh, was fortunate enough to, to get to work with some of these guys and to know them personally. Um, and I've also, you know, had mentors throughout my career, teachers at School of Visual Arts that have kind of uh, hooked me up with jobs, David Matt, uh, the guy I worked with at Esquire, David Kirkarito, these guys kind of 
showed me uh, and, and took me under their wing and, and, and taught me how to take risks and, um, but just worked my ass off. <laughs> so I'm like Matthew McConaughey, I'm my biggest inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Completely. So, so is there time for one more? Uh, yeah, there's is there? Um, uh, it was great to meet another Maurice. We need to talk after this. Okay. Um, I, I, um, I wanted to get to this issue, and, and it was something that, Phil, you, you brought up when you mentioned uh, President Obama's uh, presidential library. Uh, and the big question underlying this conference of, you know, you know being black in design and does our cultural currency uh, help at all in dealing with you know, telling our own story? Uh, and uh, when the museum um, was being conceived of and the competition was public, uh, I entered into a conversation with Steve Lewis, who's another Loeb Fellow, about um, who will tell our story. Uh, and I had the great privilege of being on the jury for this uh, building, and I must admit, um, being uh, in the position of deciding who will tell the story was just as important as the people who got to tell the story. Um, I think it shouldn't be lost on this young audience that there were seven members of the jury, and there were only two who were architects. One was myself and Adele Santos. We were the majority on that committee. And you had some incredibly, incredibly stiff competition. But you won it based on the excellence of your proposal. But I will also say you won it on the composition, the cultural insight that you had to partner with Max Bond and David Ajay. So we had this cross-continental, um, cross-Atlantic uh, team. There was nobody that could touch the narrative that you all constructed. And that was before you put pencil to paper. So I have to think that there's something about being you know, black in design that uh, made you compose your team that way um, so that you could win it purely on excellence and merit. So now the question is, President Obama is going to commission his library. And who will tell that story? <laughs> Well, who, sh who should tell that story? And you know, this is not about a set aside or anything. No, so no, no. I'm curious yeah. about really what you think yeah. about this, whether, you know. Well, I think that there is uh, some cultural currency, to use your term, uh, to be applied in certain projects. And um, having lived through the civil rights uh, movement coming up in the 60s and, and experiencing that, I think was an advantage uh, in a project like the one behind me in, in Atlanta. And, um, and so, uh, who will tell the story? I think we, we, we have a, a partial answer to that because the process for the Obama Presidential Library is uh, off and running. There, there was a request for qualifications in August. Uh, we submitted just last month. How do I get on that? <laughs> I would love for you to be on that, sir. And, but there is a jury, to, to your point. There is a jury, and so they'll make a choice. Uh, and we, we don't know whether uh, an American, an African American, an American architect. There, there are many, you know, or a Chicago architect, right? You know, it's going to be built in Chicago. Um, a biracial architect. You know, there, there are all sorts of <laughs> there are all sorts of currencies that can be brought out and tried to, to apply. So, um, but we do know that, there, that that the first cut that there was an invited list, which we were part of, but then it was also open for anyone to apply. So there are over 140 submittals uh, of qualifications for that project. And so there'll be a series of um, narrowing that down. And we're told that at the end of the day, the First Lady and the President will be engaged in, in the interview process. So I think they are going to determine who tells the story. And I think it's going to wind up being um, someone who resonates with, with that couple, right? And, and uh, so we'll see. Thank you.
What an incredible way to end these two days. Thank you so much. Can you, you. all join us in thanking both Daryl and Phil and all of our speakers today? with our thank yous, this conference really would not have been possible without the collaboration and support of a lot of people. So we would be remiss if we didn't take the time now to thank everyone publicly. So we'd like to begin with thanking Dean Mostavavi for allowing us the space and the support institutionally. Dean of Students, Laura Snowden, thank you for your support. And Ben Prosky, uh, he is from the communications office, and his office was the first to step up to offer us seed funding for this conference. Carlos Reyes, Student Services Coordinator, thank okay. you. <laughs> And we'd also I'd like to thank Jerry Niederhoff, and she really helped us so much with registration and making sure everything went seamlessly there, so thank you. We sh should also mention Jerry is the Director of Admissions and Diversity Recruitment Manager for the school. Um, I actually met her first at Howard University where she was doing a diversity recruitment there. <laughs> John Aslanian, Director of Student Affairs and Recruitment. Uh, and Trevor, uh, Trevor O'Brien was Assistant Manager of Building Services who helped us get this space um, and all the spaces we've used this, this weekend. Mm -hmm. And finally, on our list of um, people from the administration to help, or to thank, Chantel Blakely. She, <laughs> without her, advice and wisdom, logistically, this, there's no way this would have been as smooth as it is. So thank you, Chantel. And we'd also like to uh, name for you the members of our advisory committee. So we have Bryant Terry, who's the chef in residence at the Museum of the African Diaspora. Uh, Chi Perlman, uh, the founder of Chi Company. Uh, Daryl Fitzgerald of Fitzgerald Collaborative. Jean Lauer, Sweden founder, and also one of the founders of the ASU. And we have Jerry Thomas, uh, of uh, Jerry Thomas Arts, he's the founder. Mark Norman, uh, director of Upstate um, and former Loeb Fellow. Mark Mulligan, co-chair of the Dean's Diversity Initiative. Michael Hayes, GSD Associate Dean, dean of Academic Affairs. Sally Young, GSD Loeb Coordinator. Taman Evans, um, co-founder of Dioscuri. Taran Evans, co-founder of Dioscuri and the Astor Gates, founder of the Rebuild Foundation. Uh, there's also a list of individuals who should be um, named specifically. Among those is Hector Torito Picard, who we have here. He is... He was a spring MLA graduate, and he was the former president of ASU, and it was under his leadership that this conference came to be. He put out a call and said, let's make this happen, and here we are today. So thank you, Hector. Um, James Stockard, lecturer in housing studies. So we have uh, Joe Steele and M Maya Wagoner, who helped us a lot with communication and outreach, especially reaching out to MIT. LaShawn Hoffman, who is one of our most, re uh, of our most recent class of Loeb Fellows. Mm -hmm. Omar Davis was an um, MLA graduate of landscape architecture. You haven't caught that one yet. Class of 14, and he was our DJ last night. And Ra Raquel Davy, president of Boss Noma. 
This was, this could not have been accomplished without a team of volunteers. So if you were a volunteer, could you please stand? Because uh, we really want to clap for you. Thank you so much. We, wait, we should thank logo design people. Um, so our volunteers are local. We had student volunteers, but we also had volunteers who flew in from other parts of the country. We have representatives here from Pin Design, UT. Uh, so it's been really incredible. So thank you for your support, both here locally and nationwide. Um, we also have to thank the team of students who designed our logo. Yes. <laughs> James Kendall, um, Master of Architecture, Class of 2018. Jeremy Hartley, um, Master of Landscape Architecture, Class of 2017. Keith Scott, over here with the camera, Master of Landscape Architecture, Class of 2017. And Keisha Hartley, thank you. Time, I would like to invite all the members of the planning committee to please come to the front so that you can be recognized. Uh, I think everyone should know who you all are, committee members. Yeah. Um, as they're coming up, we would also like to thank um, Bryant, Terry, Cassandra Campbell, and Dee Dee Emmons, and all of those who helped them prepare the meal that we ate today. Thank you. And, and in our lunch also, many thanks to Paco. Uh, so, should we go through the committee? Yeah, we, yeah. we wanted to see all of us. It's a lovely group of ladies who have been working really all year to put this together for you. Thank, thank you so much. You have been so amazing to work with, and thank you. two cents though, this conference could not have been possible without Kara and Courtney C plus C as we like to call them in emails. Really, you guys have done a phenomenal job and we couldn't have done it without you. And I'm sorry to overhaul for a second. But is it possible for Mosin, Laura Snowden, Jerry Naderhoff, Mark Mulligan, and also Chantel to come up please? because you guys have been phenomenal and we appreciate it so much. invite up our volunteer coordinators, um, yes. Broderick Spencer, uh, let me make sure I get all of the names, um, Warren Haggis, yes, Lola Fagbami, uh, Francisco Lara Ga Garcia, who you saw earlier today, unfortunately had, he had to leave us a little bit early, um, Stephanie Lynn and Vaughn Horn, can you all please come up? everyone's hard work, your participation, and also thank you all for being here because otherwise we'd just be talking to ourselves. So <laughs> this, you are a part of this. So thank you all so, so much. And I'm just noticing the only person up here who doesn't have a flower is Dana <laughs> McKinney. And she deserves many flowers for being tireless and amazing and okay. super hardworking. Okay. On behalf of all of us, thank you. Thank you. Really <laughs> Thank you.
May, may I just use Dean Lee's prerogative to just really thank you all for being here. The atmosphere in this room for the last day and a half has been absolutely electric. And one thing that I would say is that this is a very special moment thanks to all these people. Uh, but also that in the field of architecture, landscape, design, planning, you know, there is not a united front out there. And in this space, there has been an absolute sense of togetherness. And I have absolutely no doubt that this group will do amazing, amazing things, precisely because they're together. If you think about the force that exists in this space, given the question that Maurice was asking, honestly, I think that this group can do anything. And I think that's really fantastic. So thank you. so much. And with that, we'd like to invite you to continue with us as we go to the reception at the Cooper Gallery, which is at 102 Mount Auburn. And we'd also like to invite all the speakers to come to the front so we can take a picture before we depart. Thank you so much. Thank you.